The WebEx is now live. Good morning and welcome to everyone to our March 25th, 2021 committee meetings. People, you please take the roll. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Chisholm? Present. Mr. West? Present. Present. Ms. Jones? Present. Mr. McKellar? Present. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Ms. Sutton? Present. Ms. Sam? Present. Mr. Warkle? Present. And Ms. Williams? Present. Okay, Ms. Chisholm, that is everyone. Thank you very much. We, the chair will now entertain a motion for 1.02. Ms. Chisholm, I'll make a motion um, to pursuant to board policies 2300 and 2450 effective for this meeting only to waive any requirements that board members participate in the meeting in person and to ratify and formally adopt the virtual meeting format described in the meeting notice. I'll second that. It's been moved and properly second that we accept 1.02. He will you call for the vote? Yes, ma'am. If you will vote using your voting machine there and I'll call for Ms. Sutton. Well, it says one, but it doesn't. It says it, but it's not showing up. Okay, so we'll just call it again. <laughs> well, it says it up there. Yes, fine. Yeah, I didn't get a one. I kept getting the eight. Is that everybody going to show hands? We'll do it that way. There to go. Perfect. That's everybody. Ms. Sutton? Yeah. <laughs> and Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Chisholm, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. We are very happy to have a special guest with us this morning, Judge King and Captain Morgan. They're going to speak to us briefly regarding the SRO program in Cumberland County Schools and the school justice program. Uh, Pete, where would they be speaking from? Right here at the podium, Ms. Chisholm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I was ordered by Captain Morgan to go first, so I'm going to go first. <laughs> no, it is a pleasure to be here and to speak to you about the School Justice Partnership Program uh, and to see so many friendly faces here. So thank you again for, for the invite this morning. Uh, the Partnership Program, just to give you a little background, I, I, we've all heard of the Pipeline to Prison uh, concept, and that is where this really uh, came about, is to try to prevent that and for Cumberland County to get ahead of that, as well as to show not only our community, uh, but the parents who have children invested in, in our school systems, that we really are trying to educate them. And even when they have behavioral issues, that we're trying to use all of the resources that are necessary prior to bringing them to the court system. Just to give you a little background about the court system, the juvenile justice system or juvenile delinquency court is not a court that is designed for punishment. The historical design of a juvenile delinquency court is for treatment. And so if you ever visit our courts, what you'll find is that when juveniles come into our court system and they're adjudicated delinquent, we don't find them guilty because we don't want to stigmatize them as we do uh, in the adult system. And so we call it adjudication. We don't call the finding of guilt. Uh, and then we say that they're delinquent as opposed to guilty. And then as you see some of the services that we use, we use wraparound services. We're not sending them to jail. Uh, we're not sending them to the or the youth development center, which is our version of a youth prison uh, or the detention center, which is our version of jail. That is not our immediate uh, go to. So if you come into our court system, what you'll find is that we're going to get an assessment of that juvenile, get them to do a comprehensive clinical assessment that's going to test them. As many of you are aware, their psychological mental health so that we can see what's going on in that aspect. We also do what we call a family assessment, which is what the DJJ department uh, representative does. And they bring the parents in and they ask the parents about their historical uh, family ties, who's in the home, because obviously we know that there's some issues there sometimes when there's a single parent as opposed to a two parent home. We also wanna know some of the background as far as has there been a history of problems with other siblings, because maybe there's something generational there or something with the parents if there's a mental health issue that's going on with anyone in the family. Uh, so we get a, 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 an intense background. We also find out from the parents the behavior of the children at home, because a lot of times these things do stem from at home, 
and we have parents that just don't have the resources or the understanding of what they can do for their children. So all of this information is gathered and then it's brought to the court system. And so when the juvenile is standing before myself or any of my colleagues, our first thing is to say, let's see if we can't get them some counseling. If that doesn't work, let's see if they need medication management. If that doesn't work, let's see if we can put them in a mentorship program. If that doesn't work, we also have things that we call a wilderness camp where we actually send the children off. We have county funds that support it that send them to a camp that teach them life skills such as uh, budgeting, grocery shopping, and just that peer-to-peer -peer relationship skills. And so once we get to that point, uh, if they mess up, come back before us, again, we're not looking at sending them to jail. What our thought process is, let's see if we can up the level of treatment. So we might do some in-home intensive treatment where the counselors go into the home uh, we also have what we call MST, which is crisis treatment that we may order. And so if parents are having a problem, a difficult problem with a child that's combative or assaultive, that parent can call that crisis counselor. That crisis counselor will come into the home at that moment, doesn't matter what time it is, to try to diffuse that situation. And so this is what the juvenile delinquency system, that's how it's designed to treat our children. The option of sending a child to either the detention center or to the youth development Center, which is again our youth uh, prison system, is the last resort, and and certainly it's one of those things where we've exhausted everything that we could possibly do, and it's just that is our last resort. But even then, we don't give up on the kids. If we send them to the detention center, if we send them to the youth development center, we also give wraparound services in those facilities as well as continuing their education. They can still graduate from high school uh, and take any classes there, and so. Again, our system is designed to continue to treat the children. And that is what the, the delinquency uh, side of our criminal justice system is set up for. So this partnership program came about because what we wanted to do was store kids even coming into our system. And so one of the things that uh, this partnership talks about, if you have ever had a chance to look at it, it's an agreement not only between the Cumberland County School Systems, we have mental health. So we had Dr. Green from the health department sign off. We have counselors that have signed off. Uh, the sheriff's department has signed off, Fayetteville PD. And what it is is that for all of us, what we wanna do is if children are having issues in the classroom, rather than take out charges, we have committed ourselves to go and utilize these other resources out here before they get to the court system. So if there's a mental health issue, the partnership agreement says, let's reach out to the mental health providers, get an assessment done and see if this won't intervene and help this child before we have to contact the court systems. And so we've tried to put every partnership that we can think of into this agreement so that we can avoid children being prosecuted. But even then we have a gatekeeper. Say for instance, teachers in the school system, you're just exhausted and you have finished, uh, you've done everything that you can underneath this partnership agreement. Uh, we can bring them to the court system and Captain Morgan will talk more about that but the DJJ or the Department of Juvenile Justice, they still have the ability to uh, do a diversion program, which means they, again, are wrap around, wrapping services around these juveniles before we actually charge them in the criminal justice system. And so again, we believe that this partnership agreement, along with the historical setup and makeup of the juvenile justice system will help us put what we call like a tourniquet in the middle of the pipeline to prison. Because certainly once a child comes into our system and they are identified as delinquent, a lot of times those children from that point on, they never escape the system because of their family history. So this just kind of allows us all to get ahead of that and hopefully protect the children, allow them to go on to school and uh, become productive citizens. Any questions? Did I leave anything out? Yes, sir. Is there anyone taking keeping up the stats of prior COVID, the pandemic, and the number of kids being involved in the program? And now, during COVID, the number of kids being involved in the program? The Department of Juvenile Justice would keep those statistics up. The issue that we have right now is, as you all know, we have to raise the age. And so the statistics are a little bit different uh, because of who can come in the system based on the new laws and who can't. 
So for instance, with the new law with raised age, if you've ever been in trouble in the adult system, even though you're under 18, you don't qualify to come into the juvenile delinquency uh, division of our system. And so the statistics are a little bit different. Uh, I can tell you that with raise the aid, we are seeing uh, a lot more violent crimes and we are seeing uh, an increase in the numbers, but that's just by virtue of we've moved all of the under 18 from criminal court to the juvenile delinquency court. And uh, certainly those individuals that were in criminal court, we're seeing just a lot more um, of the serious crimes. And the, well, the reason I ask that question is I often hear comments about the effect of not having uh, children in school and being at home all day, being around their parents all day, and this kind of thing that is having mental effects on them. So I was just, that's why I asked the question to see if there was data that would prove that statement to be accurate or not, you know. I understand. And there is data that's out there, but like I was saying, because of the new changes in the law, it's just difficult to pull out to see whether, right now, to see whether or not pre-COVID, the juveniles, we had roughly about 300 juveniles in the system, and to see how that pans out now, especially since we've added uh, the children from the adult court and moved them to the juvenile court. So probably within the next several months, we could probably give you exact numbers as to how that's uh, been affected. Um, what has been the failure or success rate of the program over the last year? Of juvenile delinquency court? Yeah, I'm talking about, I mean failure or success, I mean kids that are born in there, get improvement and get taken out of the system without any problems. The those that uh, go into the system, but they end up uh, continuing to have the problems or stay within the system. I don't have the exact statistics on that. I would say that we have uh, a pretty good success rate with anything. Uh, you know, obviously we do have those individuals that graduate from juvenile delinquency court and they go on to criminal court. Uh, but for those children that I have seen that have been successful, you know, we've had kids that were uh, gang members that have gone on and graduated from college and come back and they speak to our juveniles. So we do have some success rate. Uh, it's definitely not a program or this division is something that you're not going to see that's going to be done away with because again we want to make sure that we give all the resources and treat them but i don't have a a, a dead fast uh statistic okay my last question so i was wrong uh, i do have another question and that is what role does uh the department of social services and the garden at lighter program play towards your program when you look at the guardian at litem and the department of social services they usually come into play when the children have been removed from the home or the department of social services has filed a petition based on abuse neglect or dependency so that's when they will uh, typically come into play if they're on the criminal side of uh, the system generally they're going to have an attorney that represents them just like a criminal lawyer would do in the uh, adult system but the uh, guardian litem would work if the department has stepped in, filed a petition, removed the children from the home, or filed a petition alleging a neglect, abuse, or dependency. And then the guardian litem serves as that juvenile's attorney. And so they go out and meet with the juvenile at least once a month to make sure all their needs are being met, if they have any concerns. And then the social worker certainly works hand in hand uh, to make sure that child gets to all of their appointments and that the placement is providing that juvenile with everything that they need. And then they all they do monthly reports to the court. Thank you. Thank you. When you started speaking, I was curious about the number of children in the program for context. And um, you mentioned it real briefly in um, one of your comments right there recently. But just to repeat it so we can kind of process and get our heads around. You said there's 300. That was pre COVID when I ran some numbers. We had approximately 300 total juveniles in the system. Uh, the majority being young black men uh, or young uh, black females. And so we did it by uh, the aggregate number. We did it by race breakdown just to kind of see where our numbers were. And that's where they were, but that was pre-COVID. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Captain Morgan. Good morning. 
Um, briefly, SRO program, we're as a resource for school administrators to use. Um, so we're, we're part of that toolbox for them to use. Anytime they need our assistance, anytime they need uh, law enforcement assistance, they call. And um, it's not just um, it's not just for us to come and do something dealing with criminal activity. It can be with us speaking to the student um, due to an issue inside of the school, um, whether it's a conflict between a kid, we use conflict resolution skills. Our, our guys get trained uh, with CIT critical incident training. And what that does is that it gives us a, a another tool to use when we come into kids in conflict. So that way we can work with them. And if they're in some type of um, uh, where, where they're having a breakdown or they're, they're not able to um, communicate or, or, they're, or they're just so frustrated that, they, that they're having a hard time, we can get them through that. And we've also added CITU. And so this is just reserved for people that deal with youth inside the schools and we're able to work with kids that are, that are having an issue. And our guys also go through school resource officer training. Uh, we recently uh, became our own training uh, section we can train our own SROs now. We don't have to send them to Salemburg. We can do it ourselves now. Uh, we, have, we have four or five of our guys, including myself, go through training through Salemburg to become an instructor for that. So we no longer have to wait on Salemburg to get a class going. We can do it ourselves. So we're trying to become as independent ourselves, you know, trying to make sure that we can get people trained and get them out there in the schools. Um, speaking about misdemeanor diversion, um, you know, we, we've had over 150 referrals to misdemeanor diversion since it's all started. And also teen court, we use teen court as a resource as well. So that way we're not sending them to the judicial system if we have to. You know, we're trying to use every resource we can to keep uh, students from getting a criminal record. And since Raise the Age has came about, it's really helped us in being able to, being able to divert kids to a, and, and students to a program that keeps them from being uh, you know, having a record. So that way when I go out to college and stuff like that, something's not gonna fall. But uh, as far as um, uh, numbers go, last school year, we've done 715 reports, which is, and that those reports can vary from a fight happening on campus to someone losing a cell phone. So it's not just criminal actions these reports are for. It could be, uh, Something happened, a, a scratch on somebody's car, or it could be a fight on school campus. It could be um, assault happening on campus. Um, we had uh, 1,246 calls for service. We taught 549 classes inside the school. Those classes vary from elementary school age to high school age. A lot of times we have teachers come to our high school student, uh, high school SROs, and say, hey, can you come teach a law related class to our kids? especially um, in history class and stuff like that, they'll ask them to come in and teach them, you know, it could be uh, constitutional law or criminal law. And uh, and in the elementary schools, we're teaching the Cumberland County Youth Development Program. It's a program we developed for um, elementary school age kids. We're also working on one for uh, middle school. And what that does is help kids work through with conflict resolution, um, not get involved in narcotics and alcohol, and also stay away from any type of criminal gang activity and peer pressure. So we used to have the GREAT program, which is Gang Resistance Education and Training. That is a good program. I have nothing bad to say about the program. The program is very expensive now. And so in order to send somebody to class, it was costing us hundreds of dollars, thousands of, thousands of dollars to send someone to school. So we can do that now here in Cumberland County, and it's saving money, and we're able to use local vendors and stuff of that nature instead of having to outsource everything to other states and other jurisdictions. We've done 700 school instrument reports, which is the Jabu, what we call the Jabu. We completed 700 of those last year. We had 12,533 citizen contacts. And what that is is a deputy walking down the hallway, talking to a kid about being late to class. Or a kid coming in their office and saying, hey, Deb, I need to talk to you about something. When I was at Southview High School, I had kids come in my, class, come in my office and tell me things they wouldn't tell their teacher and their counselor. 
because I was out there interacting with them in the hallways. And they see me as a resource, see me as a tool for them to come talk to. And that's what our main focus is, has been SRO. And also being a deterrent for those folks that are on the outside that might be trying to get into the school and hurt somebody. You know, um, that's the biggest thing about having that patrol car parked outside in front of that school. Is people, people see that patrol car and they're like, somebody in there that's going to make sure that I don't hurt anybody. And so that is one thing I can say about, I do like seeing that patrol car parked out in front of those schools because it does give a sense of security to that, to that building, I feel. So, um, and we had 1,165 school events last year. Of course, since COVID and everything, of course, our school events have dramatically dropped. And these numbers have dropped as well, the reports. But we're still doing reports, even though school is, has been on a uh, B and now going into an A. Even when the kids are virtual, there's still things happening over that computer and we're having to do reports on it and having to investigate it. But the numbers have dropped dramatically for sure over this time period. But our SROs are still staying engaged in the schools, still going by the schools, talking to the administrators, talking to the staff. If there's anything they need, any resource they need, we're there to help them. So, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Captain Boyd, for coming yes, sir. I was just wondering, I, I don't have any questions directly for you. I just don't know how many people know Bruce. Are you going to speak this morning? You're not on the agenda to speak, are you, Bruce? <laughs> Well, we've got some new board members, and, and you know, Dr. McKell or Mr. McKellar, you know, brought this up, and, and you guys have come to speak. But I wish Bruce would share his background and how long you've been with the school system, and what your role is as a reminder to some of us, and maybe a first time for the rest of us. Before you come up, I have a question. I'm sorry. just giving everybody the opportunity. Uh, um, good morning. Good morning, sir. And first, I want to say that uh, I thank you guys for coming to kind of. SROs do an outstanding job, okay? Yes, sir. However, there are some counties for SRO pro, they would probably have a board member say the same thing to them. And that stays true until they have an incident. And once that incident happens, it goes all over North Carolina and may go nationwide. And we've had a couple in North Carolina. So my, my first question is, uh, the screen is what is the screening process for officers who are interested in becoming SRO? And I'm uh, looking at what the psychological impact to see if they have that temperament and the concern that they can separate their duties as a police officer now in this new role where that stays, but they have also a secondary responsibility because now they're in an environment where they're working with young people. Yes, sir. That's usually accomplished through our interviews. When we when we bring them in, we talk to them, make sure that hey, they've got the right temperament. We also look at you know um, their job history. I mean, if there's something in their, in their what we call a jacket, which is their what's been going on through their career. Um, at this point in time. We are having an issue with finding people applying for law enforcement. I have an issue with people applying to being a teacher or being a firefighter or being an MS. Public service is taking a hit right now. And um, so we screen them as much as possible. And plus when they interview for the sheriff's office, whether you're an SRO or a deputy sheriff, you're a deputy sheriff. And so the sheriff has a very high standard as to who he hires with the sheriff's office. And so if there's something going on where he can't be a deputy sheriff, he can't be an SRO. And so we, we always make sure that we are very um, uh, vigilant on making sure that we check these guys out as far as backgrounds and stuff of that nature. But also when they go through BLET, that's four months of training. Then they get out BLET, they go through another 300 or so hours of FTO training, field training officer. Then when they get through FTO training, if they apply to be an SRO, we send them through another two-week FTO training 
was the senior SRO. And so during that two weeks, we're able to see how they interact with kids, how they interact with the staff, how they interact, you know, on their own, because we let them, you know, the first week is kind of saying, hey, this is what we do, this is how we do it. The second week is, you show me how you do it. And show me, you know, your skills. And so they, they go through a, it doesn't seem like it's a long time, but almost a year of training and getting skills and shadow, a job shadowing somebody. So it's it's a long process just to become that leader. And I appreciate that. When we do have incidents, and these are occurring in other counties, like the one that I that comes to me right now was the incidents in I think it was Roseville, north of Raleigh, <clears throat> where that uh, an SRO body found a young female. When those incidents occur. Do that information gets transmitted to all counties and SRO operations so that you can, it, that it's been evaluated and even though this SRO met all the criteria, did not see this in that person, the cause is the same when those things happen. What caused that? Was he having a bad day? That we have sometimes people will say about incidents. Or what is that feedback? Well, a lot of times when we see negative impacts, you know, of whether it's an SRO or just a law enforcement officer in general, we take that as a learning experience. We say, hey, look, this is something we need to look for. This is something we need to train for. This is something we need to make sure that we don't make that same mistake. So we always try to make sure that we are um, paying attention to what's going on throughout the nation and making sure that, you know, we don't replicate the same mistakes that other agencies have. And, you know, is there going to be mistakes made? Yeah, there's, there's going to be mistakes made. Are we going to try to prevent that from happening? Yes. I can promise you it's never going to happen. I can't promise you that. But I can promise you we are taking every step we can to make sure we prevent it. Okay, so the steps that you are taking when you hear of these, but are you getting any feedback from those departments where the incident occurred? as to their evaluation of what took place so you can build on on what they supply to you other than we're not we're going to address this we won't make sure you don't happen but this was what caused this particular incident to happen from this special this sro so this is what we got to be aware of as you go forward in trying to make sure that it doesn't happen if we can receive that information mm -hmm. yes sir oh okay you know, if it's a disciplinary issue, of course, there are certain rules and regulations they can't share information with us, but we try to get as much information as we can as to that situation, what happened. And um, we have a lot of networks that we can receive information from different agencies that they will put in a, um, in a newsletter. And so in that newsletter, sometimes they'll put those events that occurred and, it, and sometimes they'll break it down to what, went, what was right, what was wrong and how to learn from it so yeah we we do use that information but sometimes we have to wait on it to be released thank you yes. dr martin Adam, clearly you're one of the trainers i don't think it's you know it's just one incident that's going to you know shape the training going forward but it's a lifetime of law enforcement experience not just yours but collectively so what is the training you're giving people? Because I think this is the question that's kind of floating around the room and not being asked clearly. What's, well, how are you training your people on the use of force, not deadly force, but physical force? We have, we have a um, continuum of force. And so we teach our guys, you know, what force is applicable at what time and when you can use that force. And so we try to, we try to teach our guys how to use the less amount of force as possible to ensure that the safety of the person that you're having to use force against and the safety of the person that that person might be assaulting or hurting or you know something of that nature so there's a lot of variables when it comes into force using force and we train those variables we train our guys to use the least amount of force as possible to get control of the situation I mean, I know it's difficult in here at the moment, uh, and I respect the opportunity you've got. You've got a loaded gun on your belt. 
And um, well, no, I mean, and but if if somebody's in your space or you're having to get in somebody's space, I respect the the difficulty in knowing that's there. It could be used against you or against them or somebody else. What I'm saying is, it's a difficult thing, and I appreciate the training that goes on. It's just no, we're sensitive to that with our, uh, you know, they're not all children; some are young adults, but are they're in our charge, and uh, we appreciate um, the difficulty of that. Yes, sir. And any time we use anything on this belt, it is it is something we're having to do to make it, make sure we take control of the situation. And and most of the times it's in defense of someone else. And uh, majority of the time it's not in defense of ourselves; it's in defense of somebody else, especially inside of the school. Uh, because when you you know when you have different situations, different situations dictate on what you're going to do at that time. Very good. Keep training them up. Thank you. Yes, sir. For those of you who don't know me, I think everybody does, but my name is Bruce Morrison. I've been with the school system now since 2004. Prior to that, I was with the sheriff's office since 1989. Uh, during that time, I worked as a patrol officer. I worked as a narcotics agent, narcotics supervisor. I was a property crimes detective. I was a major crimes investigator, major crimes lieutenant, arson task force commander. And before I was recruited to come to the schools, I ran the homicide unit. Um, I'm a lieutenant still with the sheriff's office. I'm the only person in our school system other than Captain Morgan that is still sworn law enforcement that is uh, working with the schools. Um, in that capacity, the sheriff has allowed me to still carry my credentials. And if something happens, um, then I can just go back into my law enforcement mode and I can help out with the situation. Um, as Captain Morgan said, uh, as far as training goes, I'm a firearms instructor, specialized driver instructor, and general instructor for law enforcement. We teach all of our folks, just like we were discussing, um, about use of force. We talk to them about crisis intervention training. We talk to them about, you know, whatever you use for your force, that needs to be your last resort. So what we do is we do a lot of training. We do a lot of folks. We get through a lot of training with individuals. And like Captain Morgan was saying, right now, there is not a lot of people trying to go into law enforcement. So we're trying to get the best we can. Get them as quick as we can to get them into the schools because my big thing is there's still a lot of folks out there that has issues and they see the school as a spot where they can get that 15 seconds of fame and i want to make sure they're not going to come to come county schools and get it so I, I thank these guys for being out there doing what they're going to do and uh if there's anything that i can help with i'm always happy to do it any questions thank you officer with you we mind introducing him this is lieutenant gary dukes He's the lieutenant and he supervises the SRO program for, for the sheriff's office. He's, he's, he's placed SRO, he's been an SRO for a lot of years. Yep. Yes, Dr. Cox. That's it. I just want to say that um, we are very fortunate here in Cumberland <laughs> County. We're very fortunate uh, here in Cumberland County schools to have um, such a positive and uh, effective relationship with uh, Tat Moen and our SROs. Uh, and so we're uh, excited about the, the, the MOU. Um, it, it focuses on the whole child, not just what happened or should happen, but how do we serve the whole child. So we're very, we're a model for the rest of the state of North Carolina. Did you have anything you want to add? I, I could just repeat the same things, uh, Dr. Conley. Uh, since I've been privileged to serve in my position, it, it really has been one of the highlights of my work uh, to you know, be a part of the relationship with the Sheriff's Office, uh, to work with Judge King and her colleagues to, to get that school justice partnership in front of this board and, and all the other partner agencies around the community. Um, you know, I, I think Dr. Connolly is spot on. I think that the, 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 the concept of, of wraparound services and the community-wide commitment to trying to keep young people out of the justice system um, is just a model here in Cumberland County. The, the degree of coordination and communication that takes place on a daily level is beyond anything I saw even in much smaller communities um, during the earlier part of my career. And, and to see the way 
uh, juvenile justice, law enforcement, mental health, um, social services, you know, the way people just pick up the phone and do what's right for kids is, is really, um, really refreshing. I was going to, um, but I still will add it to the record. I would like to thank um, both Judge King and Captain Morgan and the other deputy for very excellent information for us and the community. We do appreciate all of the wonderful work that their departments do for our youth and our community and know that they, you are really appreciated. Also, we want to thank, thanks to Bruce, to Bruce also for all of his outstanding services to the school system. And we appreciate you and we, we notice your appearance at all of our events. And thanks to Nick for his comments. Um, all of these comments are good. It's good for us to know. It's also good for the community to know because at some times we have been um, unfortunately accused of being a pipeline to prison. And that is the last thing that this school system or the, the police community want. We want to um, get our children in time and get them in uh, excellent training so that they can grow up and be productive citizens. Thank you all very much. We will move on and now I will um, introduce Mr. McKellar to convene the Auxiliary Services Committee. Again, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, this is the Auxiliary Service Committee. Charles McKellum, Chair. My members is Ms. Deanna Jones, Ms. Donna Vaughn, and Mr. Greg West. Uh, I now will move to 2.02, .02, consider adoption of the agenda. Could I get a motion on that? Uh, I make a motion to adopt the agenda. I second it. It's been moved and properly second to adopt the agenda. Uh, Pete, could you call the roll? I believe our voting um, machine is working. If there's okay. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Let's move to uh, 2.03, consider approval of the March 2nd, 2021 committee meeting minutes. Could I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the uh, March 2nd, 2021 committee meeting, meeting a minutes. second, please. Uh, did you second it? A second, no, no. Uh, I second it. Okay. It's been moved and properly second uh, to approve the March 2nd, 2021 committee Meeting minutes. Did you call the roll? Oh, we'll go ahead. Okay, Mr. McCullough, that's your name. Okay, thank you. Next item is 2.04 consider approval of the Van Story Elementary School pipe replacement. Mr. Good morning, everyone. I know you have a lot of important stuff on the agenda to include these projects we have. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of introduce all three items. They're all projects. They're all with bid, current bids on them, and we're bringing them to the board for approval. Um, you, the data has been provided with you to show us the bids that were received and the cost of each project. And Donna Fields from Operations is here if you have any questions about any of the three. So we ask the board's approval for all three items. Arise each of the three items. Just a brief summary. Yes, sir. So, the Van Story. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Van Story is a hydronic pipe replacement. Uh, it was estimated to come in at a little less than 300. So, initially, uh, performance and payment bonds were not required, but because it came in. Over 300,000, we um, did a change order for the um, to put to require payment performance bonds. Smith refrigeration was the lowest bidder. 
this project is on the capital improvement list for this year. Uh, the second project is our um, Brady Chiller service. This is an annual service agreement that we have um, through Brady Services. They will service 49 of our chillers throughout the county with four inspections per year. Uh, this contract is $116,000. We added two chillers that we installed last year to the, to the existing contracts. So. And the third one is for the Southview Middle School HVAC replacement. This will be phase two of three. Last year we did phase one. It came in at a million dollars and the schedule was extremely tight. So we decided to break the last two phases into half and half. So this year we'll get the um, third third and next year we'll get the fourth third. I mean the fourth fourth. So. Um, and it did come in at, uh, it was estimated to come in at over 500,000. So it was a formal bid. Any questions? No. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Donna, the biggest, sorry, the biggest one for me is the Brady, the chiller contract. So you've got, say we've got 49 chillers. In our yes, system. sir. So they're looking after all of them. Yes, sir. And we do have, I'm sorry, we do have two that are carrier chillers, but we have carrier perform that, that service because these are all brake trained chillers. Yes, sir. Too many people to do it. And so I guess we're happy with them because I mean, that's the, you know, the key to the life of the unit is proper maintenance. Yes, sir. They do uh, a complete service maintenance um, schedule for inspections a year, do the maintenance on it. Uh, they also do a refrigerant management. So if we're losing any refrigerant or anything like that, they keep track of that. Also how that needs to be corrected or anything like that. I'm curious, I mean, they're doing those unsupervised, I guess. How do you verify that they're doing the, the checklist of what they better do is pretty long. How do, how do you, is your department? We, well, I know they're on the hook if something breaks, but still it's our yeah. expensive it breaks. Yeah, so we, um, they, re, they provide a, report with each inspection and Mark Harris, our HVAC special projects manager, uh, follows along after, follows the contract all the way through the year. Roofs are, well, those are our biggest source of complaints. Roofs are our probably biggest expense. Yes, sir. Uh, with the building, so thank you for looking after it. I'm good. Okay, this for committee members. We got, I'd like to make a motion to approve all three at one time, 2.04, 2.05, and 2.06. I get a second, a second on that? A second. It's been properly moved and second that we approve all three, which is 2.04. Consider approval of the Vanstory Furniture School Pipe Replacement Project, 2.05. Consider approval of the Brady Chiller Service Contract Proposal. And 2.06, consider approval of the Southview Middle HVAC replacement project. Unless there's some questions from the members, it's time to vote. Okay, Mr. McKellar, that was unanimous for all three. Okay, uh, we'll move to 2.07. Consider other committee concerns. Are there any members that have any concerns? I see none or hear none. Uh, at this point, I adjourn the Auxiliary Services Committee and I turn it over to Student Services Support Services Committee, Ms. Susan Williams. Here. Thank you, Mr. McKellar. And I'll call the Student Support Services Committee to order. Um, the people on the committee are myself, Mr. McKellar, Ms. Musgrave, and Mr. Warhol. And if I could get a, a motion to approve the adoption of the agenda, that's 3.02. I will uh, make a motion to approve the adoption of the, the agenda. Thank you, Mr. McKellar. Is there a second? A second. second Thank you, Mr. Warfel. And if you'll vote, and Pete, we'll have to call for Ms. Musgrave. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Warfel, it's cool. Oh. Okay, Ms. Williams, Thank you. And 3.03 is our next item, approval of the March 2nd 
Student Support Services Committee meeting minutes. I move to approve 3.03, consider approval of the March 2nd, 2021 Student Services <laughs> Committee meeting minutes. A little alliteration of that. Is there a second? A second. A second. Thank you, Mr. Warble. And we'll take the vote. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay, Ms. Williams, that is unanimous. Right. And I believe Dr. Black is in place at the podium, looking official this morning. Uh, we're moving to 3.04. We are <clears throat> considering the approval of the 2021 National Child Abuse Prevention Month Proclamation. And um, Dr. Black, I'll turn it over to you. And maybe Ms. Story, Pam Story. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Black. Do you want me to continue? Yes, please. Please proceed, Ms. Story. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's really, it's great to be here today. And um, April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And that is a time that we come together to heighten awareness about the devastating effects of child abuse and neglect on all children. I ask that you accept the proclamation before you today. And as always, we will be planting a pinwheel garden in front of Cumberland County Central, Cumberland County School Central Office on April 1st. And each of you will receive pinwheels after the meeting today that you're certainly we want you to add your pinwheels to our garden. Thanks to a generous donation from Dr. Natasha Scott, Pinwheels are being sent to every school in Cumberland County, and we are asking the principals if they will also have their staff plant a pinwheel garden outside of every school. As you know, we're all mandated reporters, and I would like to just share in closing that the number one type of child abuse that has been reported for, from Cumberland County Schools this year is educational neglect. The numbers are down because of the pandemic. And so we want um, the children to come back to school safely because we know that abuse and neglect has not stopped since we've been on the pandemic. And so educational neglect referrals are up because we're out trying to get those students who have disengaged to come back to school using porch visits, emails, any means necessary. So I thank you so much and ask for your support for the Proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month in April. Pam, thank you for that information. And, and let me say, I, there's no doubt that I'm, I don't, I wonder how many porches you've been on because mm -hmm. that little Volkswagen gets around to where it needs to go. And um, even with information sometimes it's not as pleasant as we'd like to hear you always present it in a way that that makes you understand how important it is for us to get our children back in school and back on track to be successful so thank you so much for all you do I can't there's just not words and i can't even imagine what your your team is facing right now and of course thank you to dr scott i don't know if she's listening in today um, visual recognition of what we're doing does make a difference in the community. So just appreciate all that. Dr. Black, do you have anything else on no, that? Just she, always, she always does a super job and she's a giant among us. And so we appreciate her work and her service. I miss you. I just want you to know that. I miss seeing you pop in here with that smile on your face. Um, at this point, Point, it's time for a uh, motion on 3.04, and I'll make that motion that we approve the National Child Abuse Prevention Month proclamation. I second that. Thank you, Mr. McKellar, and we'll take our vote. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. 
Okay, Ms. Williams, that's your name. All right, we'll move to 3.05, approval of the 2021 CCS Month of the Military Child Proclamation. And um, Dr. Black, I think we have Mr. Lattimore with us. We do indeed, Ms. Williams. And uh, we are very excited about what's going on in the Common County School System in terms of our uh, support with our military families. And so I'd like for Mr. Lattimore at this time to share some highlights of what we're doing across the district, even during this pandemic at this time. Mr. Lattimore, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Black. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. All right, I'm Mr. Lottimore, I'm the district military liaison, and April is designated as month of the military child. So I'm here to talk to you about the proclamation. Cumberland County Schools joined with the state to celebrate the resilience and the sacrifice of our military children in April. And this year we have over 13,000 military connected students enrolled in Cumberland County Schools. So throughout the month of April, schools will be hosting events uh, and as our schedule permits, I ask them to share so we can attend some of those events. However, throughout the week of 12 through 16th April, with Stephanie Shook and I, we have events going on throughout the county, which we will finalize Tuesday and we will share with everyone uh, for that. And April 16th, save that day, April 16th is Purple Up Day, and we ask every Cumberland County Schools employee and students to wear purple in recognition of our military students on April 16th. Therefore, I ask the school board to proclaim April as month of the military child and support school and district events. And furthermore, uh, Dr. Black may update you that all of our schools are purple star school, all 89 of our schools. So more to follow on that and uh, to celebrate our district, our school district. And I thank everyone for their support because it was definitely a team effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lattimore. And um, Dr. Black, were you gonna share some more information about the 89 our purple schools? I know right. we talked about it yesterday. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma we are scheduled to be involved in the celebration later on. And this is exciting because last year we did not have all of our schools on board to receive this recognition. So due to the hard work and the team effort that has taken place across the district under Mr. Lattimore's leadership, we are proudly being recognized as a district of high standards for our military community. So we appreciate that. Much Mr. Lattimore, we appreciate all you're doing with our um community and the 13,000 children that you're representing. Obviously, you're doing some great work. And uh, Dr. Black, we appreciate the work you're doing with him to get all of our schools qualified for this honor. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Do I have a motion to approve 3.05? <clears throat> I move to uh, approve 3.05. Thank you, Mr. McCower. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Warfel. And we'll take a vote. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay, Ms. Williams, that's unanimous. All right, that's great. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to 3.06, other committee concerns. Dr. Black, I think you have an item that you want to bring to us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for the opportunity to bring this before you all uh, on the other concerns. Uh, I get somewhat emotional when I want to talk about this because we are so vested in our children and we are staunch advocates for them always. So about two years ago, I appeared before you with a proposal for a policy called the Differentiated Diploma Pathway. This policy authorized Cumberland County Schools to consider the unique situations of some of our students who fell within the category of at risk and they were in jeopardy of becoming a dropout or some of them had already dropped out and we were able to recover them and provide an avenue so that they could return and graduate uh, after meeting the state minimum uh, requirements of 22 credits, as opposed to the district's requirement of 28 credits. This same opportunity was extended to students at A.B. Wilkins High School and you granted approval for that. Today, I'm returning to advocate for some of our seniors in the current graduating classes across the district who now find themselves in a situation where they might not be able to graduate due to certain challenges 
beyond their control that might be associated with COVID-19 and the pandemic. We have a regulation on the screen today, the policy 3460R1, and we're asking for your support to expand temporary access to the differentiated diploma pathway for school year 2020, 2021 only with this added language. And I wanna read that from the slide as we have it in the regulation. It says that in recognition of the unique challenges and hardships posed by the COVID-19 pandemic during the 2020-21 school year, all Common County School seniors of the class of 2021 will be allowed to access the differentiated diploma pathway, the DDP, and will be allowed to graduate with a minimum of 22 credits as allowed by the state of North Carolina. For purposes of this temporary provision only, all of the normal DDP eligibility requirements set forth below and the referral and decision process are waived. And so we're asking for an expanded temporary access to the differentiated diploma pathway for school year 2020, uh, 2021 for our seniors who might find themselves in a precarious position. For Dr. Black, she and I discussed this at length yesterday, and and um, the, the plus for this, and about the students who are literally in limbo, that are not going to be able to get a diploma this year, but will be able to get it under this. So, are there questions for Dr. Black or? I have one. Uh -huh. um, with the twenty-two hours, which I, I think this is credits. a great thing for uh, credits. Um, Will that include the core, core, the main courses that they have to take, the Englishes and the maths, that all of that, those will have been taken in pass? Yes, ma'am. They will have been taken in pass. They are now probably doing elective courses. So they have met the state's minimum requirements. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Mr. McCallum. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Black, I think you're doing an excellent job with this program. Uh, as I look on the board here, my comment is, I guess we'll go against the uh, policy, and that is that if I read uh, in recognition of the unique challenges and hardship posed by COVID-19 pandemic during the 2021 school year, all coming county kind of seniors in the class of 2021 will be allowed to access the differential policy, the normal pathway, and will be allowed. This is where I think I have a problem with the word will be allowed to graduate with a minimum 22 credit. That gives me a negative connotation because the state of North Carolina, that's all that is required. Okay. Uh, you can receive that, but to make it sound like a student is just graduating with 22, to me is a negative connotation. You know, I think we got we have to work on that policy there. Uh, because it should have just said the class uh, will graduate with a minimum, not be allowed. I mean, that's the standard from the state and uh, as allowed by the state of North Carolina. So that's my only negative okay. comment that I would have. And that's the policy. Not Ms. McKenna uh, and board members, uh, but it seems the moment if we simply say we'll be allowed to graduate with 22 credits as allowed by the state of North Carolina and take out the word minimum. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you're making it sound like there's a minimum that for some reason, these students are graduating with 22 credits and they're not fulfilling the full obligation. But you're saying to take the min the word but minimum. The word yeah, minimum. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I agree with Dr. Connor. I agree, right. right. We can do that. Okay. And this is attached to that policy in terms of rigor. Okay. You can always go beyond what's necessary, but as long as you meet the minimum requirements in any form, in any organization, in any test, you're good to go. You're good to go. Okay. Most of them have certainly met more than yes. minimum at this point. All right.
definitely worthy. And what is it you always say? You have to do what's right, right. For, kids. for kids. Nick's already said it this morning, and that's continuing on this pathway, I believe. Okay, so Nick, my question is, can we... <coughs> Can we make a motion to approve this right now? Does this need to come up at the next? How? It's, it's uh, crafted as part of the regulation that okay, accompanies so, the, the overall policy. So we're you okay. know, when the board approved the the differentiated mm -hmm. diploma pathway policy, it allowed flexibility mm -hmm. for implementation through administration. Okay. So, so we're as good. I understand it, the purpose today is to just be completely transparent with the board yes. and, okay. and, of course, you know, seek your support for this this aspect of implementation of the policy. But as a regulation, it doesn't require That's Just that. making sure yeah. and expanding it in a broader sense than what we have had. And I don't want to come up and then there'd be a problem because it was not on the book right. It's, so if we're good, I'm good. Committee members, board members, everybody? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Black. Thank you so much. Are there any other committee concerns? Dr. Black, is, she's done her part this morning now. We might, we might need to step it up. <laughs> All right. I will adjourn um, our committee and turn it over to Mr. West, Budget and Finance. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, on the Budget and Finance Committee are myself, Mr. McKellar, Ms. Sutton, and Ms. Williams. Uh, first item is uh, 4.02, consider adoption of the agenda. I'll make a motion we adopt the agenda. I will have it. Thank you, Williams and McKellar. Um, let's vote for that. Ms. Sutton? That's a yes for me. That's unanimous. 4.03 is approval of the March 2nd Finance Committee meeting minutes. And Pete, we don't thank you enough for all the work you do in generating those and their spectacular minutes. Thank you, sir. I move that we approve uh, the committee meeting minutes for March 2nd. And I second that. Thank you both. Uh, let's vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous, Mr. West. Yes. Thank you. 4.04 Clyde is at the podium. Uh, approval of budget amendments. Good morning, board members. Um, Chairman, uh, before you this morning are our amendments for the month of March, and I present them to you for your review and your approval. I make a motion that we approve 4.04. Um, just no, just for record keeping the one pretty far down for the Cargill grant the explanation is type it's a typo from the previous one um, it's pretty far down just note that and clean it up okay. it's a, we will thank the you. one from before on copy and paste so just um, note that any other questions on the budget amendments I'll entertain a motion to approve it I'd make a motion we approve. I second. I second. Thank you both. Let's vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Can you give me the question? Every day, Greg, that you hear me. Ms. Sutton, we can hear you. Okay. Very good. And did you vote yes? Yes. Thank you. Mr. West, that's unanimous. Thank you. Approval of bid awards, uh, 4.05. Mr. Chairman, we have five bids we're bringing for you this morning. One for HEPA air purifier units to be uh, distributed in our various schools, fire operations and maintenance department. Uh, one for professional psychological services that will be used uh, to support our, our students and our schools. Um, thirdly, for network switches and hardware, our technology department will provide this additional equipment to strengthen our technologies uh, throughout our district, uh, charging adapters to support our Chromebooks and our, our students and their uh, devices. And finally, uh, Microsoft licensing. This is an annual renewal for uh, the Microsoft software that we use uh, each year. We're asking for your approval of each of these. Uh, we have a, a recommended uh, vendor 
uh, for each uh, bid. After evaluation by the appropriate department, looking at specifications, we have recommended the lowest responsible bidder uh, in each area. All right, and thank you for the summary document. That's uh, easy to understand. These run the gamut from technology to air quality to psychological services. Does anybody have any questions about any of them individually? I have a couple, but I'll wait. I do. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, um, is for uh, under psychological services. Um, have you used Paymont Institute before? Um, we, do, we have not used them before in the sense that we are presenting what they, but we do have an MOA out there right now with them. And so they are able to provide for added services or support, you know, testing uh, for our system. And I think this MOA has almost gone through process uh, as I speak. Okay, thank you. Well, I mean, you know, we've used them in a limited system, not to the extent that we are asking to use them now. Okay. Because it's so difficult to find psychologists. Well, but along those lines, though, I mean, for not having used them, 275 is the roundabout number that we're expecting from them. Is that feasible? I don't know how big of a firm they are or, or not. I mean, is it realistic to expect them to be able to provide 275? I think this was this was part of the um, specifications that were put to get put together and sent out to the various vendors for them to um, provide their bids. They have indicated they could meet that and the price of 850. Uh, I believe they were the only uh, responder in this particular category that uh, could could meet the qualification. Uh, anybody else? Let's talk about air filters and that may be Donna or Joe on the, the first one. It looks like it's round, round numbers is 3000 air purifiers and a million dollars more or less. Um, and I don't think anybody's going to argue against air, HEPA air filters, but what I see happening is the maintenance of them and the filter changes and every place I've seen them where they're in an office or a, a restaurant or whatever, they're dusty and <laughs> they're abandoned and just running or not running. So while I support going in this direction, how are we going to make sure they're good for the long haul? Um, yes, sir. So we, we decided to um, look into providing air purifiers in no, our. Speak up. I'm, I'm sorry. Focus on. I'm sorry. Right. So we um, air purifiers are one thing that is efficient, beneficial, and scalable. So we've identified some areas where we need to. Um, add air purification systems to to increase the ventilation uh, and filtration of the air. These are going to be in areas where we have interior classrooms that don't have windows that open, some exterior classrooms that don't necessarily have windows that can open. We'll be using them in areas like cafeterias, dance rooms, band rooms, um, areas like that, PE rooms, uh, where we're just adding the additional filtration can benefit um, and 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 also for some offices we went ahead and uh, put bids out for smaller units and medium sized units so as we continue to do our HVAC upgrades we can move these air purifiers around to where they'll be helpful until we can get to doing that HVAC upgrade um, we did order filter kits for each one of them the HEPA filter kits usually last for about four to five years. The, uh, we also did not spec anything like uh, an ionization process or a uh, UV light process because that adds to the maintenance issue. And it also, the EPA has scientists that really don't recommend any of those um, types of air purification in schools because there's some other issues that can be associated with those. So these are these are simple air filters. I mean, air purification filters relying on, I mean, air purifiers relying on HEPA filtration. 
Now we will have to have a maintenance schedule to change the pre filters, which are usually like a carbon filter. That will filter out the larger particles. It's very easy. That's something that the custodians can help with. And then just general cleaning of the, the air filter itself. These are very simple, but very powerful and effective units. We put some pretty strict specifications on what we were looking for. What's the lead time? Because the whole world's backed up right now. Okay. Um, as soon as we put in the order, the first 150 of each size will be in house between 15 and 20 days. And the, and then the rest of them will come in and the, the order will be completed within 60 days. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a question for technology. So we're getting 5,000 power adapters. And this kind of speaks to the name need to electrify the classrooms. If the, are we getting cords to desk or, or what are we changing? With the kids needing power, this to charge them after hours, or, or we got an opportunity now or a need to introduce, you know, all these laptops are now in the classroom being used. Where are all these chargers going to go, and how are they going to be hooked up? We don't have that many plugs in the building. I can speak to that if if, if I can. We. Um... We sent our cords home with our students so they could have them at home and we're trying to get cords. Now the cords won't be loose in the classroom. They'll actually be placed in the charging uh, carts. There was actually a cube that can do 10 at a time. It distributes the power over those 10 so it doesn't overload circuits out off of, of the wall. But the cords that we're purchasing will be put inside the charging stations, not just plugged into outlets. All right, so it's replacing the ones we sent home that usually don't come back. Or Correct. Replace it. Okay. I'm fine with that. All right. Anybody else? If not, and I do. And every child has to take their device home and then bring it back. So they they're not leaving devices in the room, Kevin, are they? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. They're they're bringing them uh, back and forth between school and home. Um, there are going to be situations where we'll have somewhere for them to lock them up uh, for situations at the school if they don't, if they choose not to bring them back and forth. But um, the cords that we have at school, they can, they're asked to come to school, bringing them to school with a full charge. And then as the day goes on and their charge goes down, they can get a quick, um, uh, a quick charge in the charging solution that we have in place that we're buying the cords for. But they are taking them back and forth from home school. I thought so. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I make a motion that we approve 4.05. Second. Thank you, Ms. Sutton and Ms. Williams. Any further discussion? If not, let's vote. Okay, Ms. Sutton? Yes. Okay, Mr. West, then come in. Thank you. Four point oh six is receive an explanation on employee installment pay option beginning July first, which I couldn't quite understand. <laughs> okay, we have been we have been uh, notified by the Department of Public Instruction. They're ending their the long time installment pay program that's av available for ten month employees in its traditional sense. If you're familiar, that's a, a program that allowed um, ten month employees to reserve some of their pay until the summer. In that case, their monthly check was reduced by the appropriate amount so that during their summer off months, a check could be produced for that same amount to them. Um, that, that situation caused um, monies to cross over from fiscal year to fiscal year. The department had to, to manage that. School districts had to manage that. Um, it is a, a process that's been in, in place for many many years now with with some difficulties and um in in keeping up tracking accounting for and reporting that annually to legislature closing out fiscal years and, and those kinds of things so as a as a process of moving forward updating with technology and, and current times 
They've ended that process and they are asking school district to put a, a process in place now that will help our employees in this situation in, in some fashion. So our state finance association has, has talked across the state with districts. There are about 15 districts that are doing an alternative installment pay plan, we'll call it at this time. And they take on a couple of different options. One is in which the employee is paid their, their salary each month for 10 months, but they have a voluntary deduction taken that is held by the district and then paid out to them in the summer. So it, it, it gets to many of the same, um, I guess, issues, concerns that, that the employees had there. A second option that is, is used in some districts is empowering the employee. They take their money, they, they save their money at their financial institution of their choice. They can put as much away as they like. They can change that as they need to. They can set it up one time, leave it alone. Uh, or they can change it as they need to. They have access to that money should they need it during the time. They can, again, they could increase their savings by just setting up a, a maybe a direct draft from their checking account when their pay comes in to their savings account uh, or whatever there. So a couple of options that are out there. The key element here is that the employees will be paid their pay, their monthly pay, their full monthly pay, each month and um, we'll set up a, a process in which it helps them with setting aside those monies in any way we can. There is one other issue that is impacted here that we will work with our employees on. Um, some of the insurance premiums that our staff participate in, health insurance is the, is the best, I guess the best um, uh, representation of that, is a 12 month premium. So if an employee only takes their pay in 10 months, you have to take two additional premiums at some point. That's usually done at the end of the year. So what has traditionally happened, if you have a, a premium that's, let's say $700 for family health insurance every month, those last two checks of the year get doubled up. So it's $1,400 for two months in a row at the end so that that money is then available to pay your premium in the summer. What we're gonna to propose to do is we'll spread those two month payments over the 10 month period of their employment with us. So we'll take a little bit each month, reserve that money for paying that premium in the summer. That will lessen the burden on the employee for that big hit that happens in those last two months of the, um, of, of their employment of, or of that particular school year and allow them to spread it over some time. Um, what After evaluating uh, what is going on, the options that are available to us, it would be our plan to offer to our employees, insist our employees in moving them towards the self-saving approach. We think that gives them the most uh, flexibility. It allows nine-month employees to participate in the program if they choose 11 month employees along with the the um, 10 month employees that are participating now plus we will implement the um, the insurance premium spreading that over the 10 months and lessening the the overall impact on the employee in in those last two months as um, as I mentioned earlier so that is is our plan as we move forward uh, we would need some time to communicate with our employees. This would be the last year of the installment. Their installment plan has been going on this year, so we would obviously have to pay those out. Those are June, July, and August payments. That'll go forward. But beginning with the new school year, July 1st, we've got to have a plan in place, and we've got to transition our employees over to a new solution as we move forward. I will share with you that we did... Um, contact CCAE and had a meeting with their leadership team, shared this, this plan with them. They emphasized uh, the two key things that we, we uh, knew is that their employees 
do participate in this plan. Uh, obviously, we have over 3,400 employees, I believe, that participate in the installment program now. And those two months of insurance are important. Some help with, with that is an important point and piece for them. And I think uh, this plan would, would help in both of those situations. Any questions that anyone has? I'll start with what leads to my confusion is the general statute reference here that teachers are required to be provided an option to receive their 10 month pay and 12 month installments. Yet DPI is doing away with that. And it sounds like we are too. Because voluntary isn't. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. How does number two meet the requirement? I, I don't understand it enough. Yeah, uh, you know, we don't have the option of, of not paying them $600 of their pay every month. That, that's not an option. We get, a, we get the majority of our money from the state and, and quite a bit of it from federal government. We can't, we can't choose to say you just hold on to it. That, that's, that's what is being shared here. That's not an option for us to do that normal uh, traditional plan. Uh, so, you know, they're asking us to put something in place to help our employees in, in this transition. Um, we, we've got we've got to follow their requirements as far as payroll and reporting, which will require us to pay them their 3500, 5000, whatever their salary is every month for 10 months. Um, but if anything that we can do that would help them and again, the, the insurance um, is is one opportunity there because the district can offer direct deposit we can direct their pay to the bank of their choice much as we're doing now um, they they have options such as um, one financial in institution offers a summer pay program where if you participate in that they'll put that money aside and they'll hold it for you until the until the summer and then make that, that available to you at that point. So some of the financial institutions are, are offering special programs, but of course, any bank has the capability of setting up at, at, at our wishes, at the employee's wish, to take $500 out of, out of my pay each month, deposit it into my savings account, deposit it into this special savings account that I'm setting up with, with you, Plus, I, I did not mention this earlier, but in that option, employees would be able to, um, to take advantage of interest that they earn on their money that they are being paid and they're saving for themselves and, um, and taking advantage of that interest. I'm sorry. So number one, I, again, Clyde, this is, I know what the 12 month pay option was. I did it, you know, it was the way I survived, honestly. Um, so number one, we take the money, it stays in Cumberland County. I don't, I don't under, I guess I, my question is from what you just said, I don't understand. Let's say they take, you, the first one would be, I say, I want $500 a month out of my check. Right. Cumberland County Schools holds that money. Yes. And, if we and, went and that, we're responsible for paying it out in the summer then. That's right. Number two, I want $500 out of my check, but I'm going to send it to... Bank of America or whatever. Wherever the employee chooses. In the first option, the employee would get their $3,500 paid to them. They'd be taxed on it. Their net would be calculated. And then if we were offering that plan, they would they would tell us, I want you to take $500, as an example, every month and hold it for them. We would then have to deposit that money and save it for them. Obviously, we're going to have to have some, some um policies and procedures around that will take away the, the employee's flexibility. We can't, you know, hardship, difficulty comes along, whatever. We can't just go writing out money, changing that. They decide they need to bump it up, reduce it, change it, whatever. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to be flexible and, and, and able to shift and move there very quickly with that number of employees in that process which is much like the process they have now. They're restricted on how much that is set aside or, or held now. It's the percentage of that check. Um, once they sign up, they're in it for the year. If they do get out, they can't get back in it till the next year. So, um, you know, we can't 
pay them out because of some hardship that comes along. So those are some of the limitations that are in the present plan, which would uh, to some extent need to follow uh, if we did a, a miscellaneous payroll deduction option for them. Would be just like if you were signed up for 12 months now, you can't, you don't have access to that money. Your check's just deducted and then you get that check July and August, as you say. That's right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. For me, in your presentation, you acted like that's what this is. You said these are what other districts are doing. The two things. Or is that what you're proposing? We do two things. I, I'm proposing that we do one of them, and our our option would be number two, that we we let the employee have their money and save it, utilize it as they best see fit. That empowers them. If they have a difficulty, they can get to that money. If they want to bump it up because you're planning a trip and they want to add another hundred dollars to it, they can handle that with their bank and you know their financial institution. So we we eliminate some of those restrictions that that might be on there with the other plan, and we open it up so that you know now our nine month employees who don't qualify for the traditional installment or the the eleven month employee. You know, any of our employees can do that because they are in charge of of their monies uh, and saving them as they they need to. Wait a minute, we pay them ten months of pay over ten months, and they're on their own for the, the two months in the summer through through their own devices. Um, you know, but the fact that three thousand four hundred, I'm just I'm fine with that because that's kind of how it plays out, but. That's going to be a shock to a lot of them, and uh, including you know my family, my mother, everybody who talked. Three thousand four hundred of our people take advantage of the twelve month option. That's going to go away, so it's going to take a lot of education and advance notice and stuff. And that's why I wanted to. This this sort of came out late, and with the the process of trying to evaluate across the state and get some input and feedback, we we just had our our, our meeting to share that across the state. So I wanted to get that. Uh, before the board, uh, or share share that with you and, and our plan for what we we plan to do, so we can begin to share that with our our staff. Um, the people who are doing there that don't take advantage of the twelve month, the three thousand, the others, <laughs> three thousand, um, they're already doing that. How you know themselves. I, I know I did the 12 month when I was a 10 month employee because I couldn't manage my, I could put it in savings, but knowing it was there, I was going to spend it. There's a reason why these 3,000 and some do this because they've had the option not to do it for as long as they've been working. So I would feel that those that are choosing their 10 month, continue choosing their 10 month. And those that choose the 12 month do option one so that, and then it wouldn't be for anybody any changes. Um, I know it looks great when a, a, all of a sudden your paycheck's really big, but um, then you're more apt to spend it. I think if they trusted themselves to do that, they wouldn't have gone to the 12 month in the first month. Okay, with number and, one though, you would help, you would take with no, the county. No, he's recommended not to do that. Okay, so this the you second. Get 10 right. months. Everybody gets ten months of pay. Except for the, I mean there's twelve month employees and they get paid every time. I know, but but the ten month employees all get it over ten months and then you're on your own. And that's cleaner, I get that. That's cleaner and we're not and that's not what's we're best for our employees. And all that. But that's gonna be a shock. Yeah. And cash flow man, there's two things you don't mess with. Somebody's money and yeah. they're Children. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, from an HR standpoint, Ruben, what do you think? I mean, is this a? I get it. They're they're in control of their money, and that's the positive for the employee standpoint. They control their own money, and we're out of the managing it for them. Right. But, but they wanted to. But they as a service, as an employee benefit, as a practice has been around since education has been around. We've been paying teachers. It's been done this way. Well. But doesn't it say well, that there will be a conflict with this month. How are we working around this yeah, conflict with the general statute, too? I think well, it's just, you just required to provide.
provide an option. It doesn't specify who actually physically, you know, executes well, the option or, or takes care of it. It's just the option. But it's not an option through us. So yeah. And let, let, right. let me share this with, with the plan. If we're if we're taking that deduction and holding that employee has been paid their their entire check. They've been taxed and it is technically their money. We're we're now having to save that money. It won't be another payroll check that we're writing them in those two months. We won't be giving them a, an 11th and 12th payroll check. We'll just be saved their money for 10 months for them. And we're going to give them a distribution, you know, at June and July or July and August, depending on the employee and their particular situation. So it, it puts us in, in the role of like a financial institution that that we're saving monies that an employee has now been fully paid and taxed on, and we become the responsible party for those those monies until the summer. Really, what's your thoughts on? Well, I think. Uh, I, I think from an employee standpoint, you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Mr. West, that we'll probably get a lot of questions. You know, from from the general number, with if you have 3,400 staff members taking advantage of the program, I think uh, Ms. Van made the the comment that I think they opted into the program for a particular reason. So I do think, you know, th there may be some some employee impact on this. I, I do I, I do agree with um, with with your statement also, Mr. West, and, and as Mr. Lockner has pointed out, that from a from a payment standpoint, it, it is significantly cleaner for employees and it does provide um, it, individuals more access to those funds. We we often receive requests for people to say, well, I, I had an emergency come up. Can I get that money? I, I, I want that paid out. Um, you know, we also have situations when employees move locations. You know, I'm teaching at this school in the middle of the year. I moved to this school. Well, we have to end that 12 month option because of the way the escrows are held out. So there's some I think financial intricacies that, that that also impact this, especially with the state not supporting it on their end. And I think um, I think this memo just basically says that they are modernizing, and as part of that, whatever they're doing now, they can't really support that. And so, from from a um, I guess from a finance burden, I don't know how that's going to impact our ability to 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 do that. But I do agree, our employees. Um, it, it is a great benefit to to provide them because of the fact that um, many employees do do uh, take part of the program, and I think it's because um, they don't trust themselves to save. I mean, I, I don't know a better way to say it that you know if you have the money there, you're more likely to access it. Stay up here, Mr. McKellar. Uh, as I listen to the the two options. Uh, I would lean towards option two. However, I do understand that it's a change for, it will be a change for many employees. And my one concern is that for the financial institution that they move to, that that financial institution have some kind of way of limiting the amount that they could withdraw unless it was an emergency that would kind of uh, address the concern that I would have that somebody might just go in there. Say if I had 5,000 in there, you know, I might want to just go in there and drop 3,000 today, you know, next week another thousand, whatever. Uh, and then I have an emergency and I don't have any money, you know. So that would be my concern. But uh, I also think that, you know, we are talking, we're teaching our students about financial responsibilities and about financial things. And I think that if we have employees, they should have enough knowledge. But if they don't, we need to embark upon them a program where they understand how to deal with finances. But I don't want to see come the kind of school system become a financial institution, much less a financial investment institution. Okay, because I don't think that's your role. Uh, I think that can be handled by other banks, investment companies, that it's just a matter of how they could work out the time control and the limit what can be withdrawn at what time, you know. I know for for banks now and depositors, 
you know, they limit us when we go to an ATM machine per day. They just use the most you can draw out of $500. Now, you may have a $1,000 expense, but if you go to that ATM, he's going to only get $500. So that kind of controls a person that has savings that they what they can withdraw at a time, you know. So that would only be my concern is trying to help the employee by not allowing them to do their through bad behavior or misbehavior to draw out more at a time when it's maybe it's not needed and not have anything when the time comes that they really need the money. Well, I was just going to say that uh, as a county employee, it is easy to become accustomed to uh, basically auto drafting all your month's ex expenses and bills and things on right after that paycheck on the first of the month. So I could see why uh, teachers would but I to want to be paid throughout the entire year. Uh, my concern with, with the option that's being proposed is, will there be an ability in teachers who, uh, under this proposal, uh, would there be an ability for teachers to, uh, I guess, pay an increase in premiums on their health insurance so that they're at the very least covered over the summer for their health expenses and things like that? So yes, that, that's what we would do for and we'll, we'll split their um, summer premiums over 10 months. Instead of hitting them with $1,400 in my example twice at the, in those last two checks, we would, if it's $700 a month for two months, we would take a hundred, $140 a month additional over the 10 months. And then that premium would be there to pay that summer. <laughs> Because we we do have to pay that premium in to the insurance carrier provider. Excuse me. Um, well, I mean, we've been in the bank for three thousand four hundred employees for you know a real long time, and we're taking you know that benefit away. I guess I just don't, and I, it takes a tremendous responsibility off the class department and cleans things up. You work for ten months, we pay for ten months. It's cleaner that way. But I just don't want them to have an adverse effect on employees. Well, we're trying to recruit more to teach and, and you know, they're going to go get summer jobs. And, and what makes people make bad decisions is financial distress. And and so if y'all, Dr. Connelly, you're in wait. What did what did they do? Uh, well, uh, if I might, uh, slide had option number two. They stopped about five years ago doing option one for the very reason that slide. As noted, um, most districts now do option two. All right. Okay. Well, it's a receive item, so I appreciate the explanation and the conversation about it. I please educate early yeah. and give them as many tools and resources as I can. And Clyde, make, and this is just for the music teacher and me. Make sure it's lingo that that it's a step by step. Number one, make sure they understand we don't have this option anymore. And sometimes we get bad rap for stuff that we have no control over. So we're not saying, Carolina County Schools not saying, you can't do 12 months. That is coming from somewhere else. So make sure it's step yeah. by step by step so that they're not, they're right now they're wrapped up in all these transitions we've made. You know, I'm watching two personal teachers, you know, they're doing great, but they're struggling. You know, they've struggled all year trying to meet the demands. So let's, this is just something else to add to that. So it, to me, it's important that this be done in a way that they understand exactly to the point. You know, we're going to still back you and help you as much as we can, but here's what we have to do. Um, I, I'm still confused on how we are meeting um, or providing the option under GS 115C 3021.1B that says teachers are required to be provided an option to receive their 10 month pay in 12 monthly installments. How are we meeting that by doing number one? I mean, two. We are um, making available to the employees the, the opportunity to direct funds. To, you know, by direct deposit to whatever financial institution they designate that will in turn, you know, hold the money for them or, or whatever. 
That's not a 12 month option that I say. If there is a financial institution that will hold the money and then be prepared to, you know, pay it to them by directing the funds to that institution, that's the provision of the option. So would you direct, I mean, what service are we providing to meet the 12 month requirement? Would, would you pay direct deposit to two different banks? I mean, employees can, can do that today if they choose. And, uh, you know, my, my communication would be, uh, you can choose your bank, your checks go in there now. All you need to do is set up a, uh, an agreement with your bank, $600 a month. Just move it to my savings on, on the fifth of the month. What, can you work out those details? But that's not and us providing them. I mean, I, 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 I hate to belabor this, but dang on, it does it, we're not facilitating anything for the 12 month option. I guess, I guess our facilitation uh, would, would be with the things that are in our control. Again, I, I can't, I can't not pay them six hundred dollars until the, every month until the end, and then provide them with another check that's been taken out of my hands. Now we get to do that. So what we can do, we can provide them the direct deposit service and get that to their bank of choice. Uh, working work with their bank to to make that available to their bank. And I can help with that burden on the insurance and not and and not push that on them in those last two months. Because, you know, that premium has got to be paid, got to be paid for 12 months. And that money has got to be available, you know, in those summer months to pay that premium. So by spreading it, we're offering an option there that is helping with some of that burden. I mean, that's helping with their expenses, but it's not helping them with to receive their pay in 12 month installments. But anyway, I'm gonna let y'all, or we're, I guess, gonna let you figure it out, but I just don't want to be adverse to the employees and it feels like it will, but if other counties have done it, if you have to bite the bullet, it's gonna be painful at first, but I guess they'll adjust. Um, Can we contract with like a securities or, or financial institution that the money can go into and let them cut those checks? Nobody probably in here did. I grew up when there wasn't a 12 month option with a single parent that every summer had to borrow money. And by the time I was grown. She was so far in debt. This might be okay for two income families, but I promise you it's not. So I can't go along with it. I just appreciate your quick question. I'm sure that. Go ahead, Walter. You start water your dad. Is the, is the idea or one of the ideas behind this proposal that if employees do opt to choose a financial institution for for the two months over the summer, that it would they would have access to those funds without having to to uh, involve the Cumberland County school system. They'd be able to go directly to the financial institution if they needed access to those funds prior to the summer months. Yes, it, it, it is their money. Uh, it is their money. They should they should choose how they want to utilize those funds, and not be, you know, restricted on uh, you know policies that we may have or procedures we may have to put in place that limit uh, them having access. If if they have an emergency and need five hundred dollars of that money, they can get it. Take care of that issue. They can bump up their transfer to their savings to get it replaced by the summer. If they they if they need to, it it, it does empower them by by giving them this up. I'll share this with because it affected my family. Um, and like you, we're two income families. But my wife switched schools mid year, and the twelve month option got took, taken from her without her really noticing it. So she's back to ten months pay. So she's freaking out that we're not going to have her income for two months this summer. Have them you know manage cash flow. And I said, we'll figure it out, but it sent her into, you know, uh, 
a fit. But it's easier than ever for people to move money electronically online than it was 20 years ago. Right. And with forethought and education and advance notice, they can send money over here and manage it more easier. You can move money around at the click of a mouse. So I think, I think they can. I know they can do it. And 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 so talking through it here, I'm I'm okay with it for that reason. And let them manage their money, and us get out of managing their money for them. Uh, great. You made, you made the comment about financial literacy, and there are really two options that we have for our employees. We have an employee assistance program that does that, that does have a financial literacy component where employees can access that if they need assistance, and that's something we can share in our communication. Um, and then also, uh, Williams also pulled me aside and said, you know, if, if that's something that becomes a long-term issue, that we may be able to do something with our partnerships to our CTE programs for, for our employees. So from an education standpoint, I do think we have some measures in place, at least one in the immediate and then maybe long-term as well. Okay. And my concern there was that uh, as adults responsible for the education of young people and part of our education system is to make them financially literate that they can deal with finances when they become adults after they go to college or whatever. I would hope that if it doesn't exist, that we would be looking at making sure that our employees who are adults have that same literacy, that they understand finances and how it affects them. Uh, because our world is changing. And whether we like it or not, it's going to even get worse when it comes to uh, handling money. It, I mean, it's, it, it amazes me. Uh, if you go to, at least my experiences, when I go to a McDonald's or some fast food places, you know, I'm in the habit of just paying cash for a five or six dollar sandwich. But young people, they don't carry no cash anymore. They have their debit card. And they put their debit card in there, you know. Um, so life is life is life is changing. And so the only thing we can do, we can't buy that. So what we are responsible for doing is bringing our people along and educating them, so that they will understand and know how to deal with it. Okay. Uh, my last comment is that I remember when ATMs first come out. I was living in New Haven at the time, and uh, people were really upset with it. And they were upset because they had built a relationship with that teller that on Saturdays, they would go to the bank and do whatever business they wanted. They had a relationship. But when the ATMs came there, a lot of the banks started cutting out Saturday. Uh, uh, and people had to go to ATM, you know. And be honest with you, I didn't like the idea myself. But today, I hate going in, inside buildings and things, you know, institutions. I, as long as I can use that ATM, you know, so I've adjusted and everybody's adjusted and we move forward. And that's just progress and that's what we'll have to deal with. But okay. that component that's needed is to make sure that they have the education and understand what's going on. I agree, Mr. Kelly. In conclusion, I just think we, we uh, don't doubt your confidency on a handling it, it's just manage and change. And that's what you're speaking of. So I think right, thanks for the update. Great. I thought that took long as I thought the budget presentation would take. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's make sure our employees great. are taken care of. So yeah. very good. All right. Uh, consider great. approval of superintendent's budget proposal for 22. Uh, great. We, I just had to say one thing before we do that. You spoke back to talk uh, about being dependent on one institution. That that would not be smart if we just limited ourselves or we pick one institution. Because in today's climate, you never know, climate you never know how financially sound an institution is. So as a district, we don't want to limit ourselves or recommend an institution to any of our employees because that opens it up for a lot of liability. Just wanted to say that.
five-minute break. The Cumberland County Schools Board of Education is currently under a five minute recess. We will be with you shortly.
Are we ready to go live again? Dr. Collin, go ahead. I assume we're live. But, uh, Thank you. I missed My children all use their phone now, so uh, it's like Facebook, that's for the old people. But um, the world is changing, uh, the pandemic uh, has certainly highlighted many of the changes. But I want to thank you, the more members, for your extraordinary leadership during these trying times. Not only you as the board members, but our premier professors, our faithful families, and our um, children who have been very resilient and our committed community partners. What I'm sharing with you today is what I call our financial plan for student success. Some call it a budget, but it is more a financial plan for student success. We need a sense of urgency. And with this sense of urgency, we need support of significant resources to support our students' academic acceleration and to address the social and the most of the impact of the pandemic on the lives of our young people. Make no mistake about it. We are reaffirming our commitment to the actions outlined in our covenant commitment, our strategic plan, 2024. It has not changed. We are reaffirming our commitment to that. What it does, the pandemic has highlighted even more the urgency of the objectives in that plan. This presentation is the funding that we need to realize that plan and see it come to fruition. We have done our due diligence with our existing budget our existing funds, and we have repurposed $300,000 within our existing funds to better man's notes. We are deferring $1.8 million worth of needs that we have identified. Therefore, we recommend that the board of education request $88.1 million from the tax commission. This represents a 9.2% increase or $7.4 million over this year's current appropriation. With this $7.4 million, we will address modernizing our learning environment. Number two, investing in our premier professor. It has been multiple years, six years, since the last time our premier professors received a supplement increase. Six years our staff have not received a pay increase. Thirdly, maintaining an exceptional learning environment. Project management to improve our building. And lastly, to address the anticipated legislative increases which we don't have any control over. 
the other seven point four million dollars spread. The majority of it is legislative. Seven million dollars of it is legislative and uh, supplement interest. Four point five for the supplement and two point six for the legislative impact. So in essence, we're only asking for four hundred thousand dollars on top of the supplement and the legislative interest. We have heard all over the world that teachers are critical. During this pandemic, it has been highlighted the value of educators and the value of public education. If that is true, and we know that it is true, they're very valuable, it is time for our commissioners, our taxpayers, our community to make public education the number one priority. And as my grandma would say, it's time for everybody to put your money where your mouth is. Educators matter. And this time, Mr. Lockley will walk us through my recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Conley. Uh, board members, we provided you a booklet which represents the uh, superintendent's budget recommendation this year. Uh, I put a copy by your place and uh, as part of our uh, board docs uh, agenda. Uh, if I can share with you some of the various components, you'll find the, book, the superintendent's budget message as he just shared there in that document. Uh, you also see our strategic plan as we've talked about through our budgeting discussions and our planning through the year, uh, budgeting is a ongoing planning process. It is a plan, a plan to accomplish your goals, your strategic priorities. So as our leadership team has been working with our various schools and departments, we've been focused on strategic plan, the strategic priorities and how we might meet them and we have in our budget bu budget business cases have identified those um, those priorities on page seven of this document you'll find a budget narrative this narrative will give some high level summary information of the total budget each fund that makes up the budget uh, represented by our state local and our federal uh, funding sources the changes and and the changes from the previous year. This uh, fiscal year 2022 budget proposes a total of five hundred and ninety eight million dollars. That's up uh, 11 percent over the 2021 budget. In addition, uh, this narrative summarizes anticipated revenues for the different funds, projects the average daily membership used for our budgeting and planning and uh, gives you some information or gives our public some information on the district staff that support our students and our schools today. In the document, you will find on page 14, a summary of our, our budgets as they're proposed at this time. These summaries provide a projected revenue and expenditures and are summarized by purpose. And the purpose basically tells us the reason for the expenditure instructional services, system-wide support for the services we provide here, for example, and we summarize it by object code. And these, the object code represents the services or commodities or products that we will use the funds to purchase in the school district. So it will pay salaries and benefits, contracted service, supplies and equipment, those kinds of things for our 2022 budget. Business cases are again a, a driver, important part of, of this budget. You'll find them beginning on page 21 and they'll continue through the rest of the document. Um, for a quick reference of our business cases, 
you can look at pages 21 to 24, you'll find here summarized a need summary of the district. So from these business cases, we've identified those district requests for funding, the local portion, and the overall total of all funding sources. Those items that have been deferred, repurposed, and are risk items to our budget and our operations within the district. Subsequent page, the next page, we'll begin to break down each of these categories. You'll see the specific district request, the, the specific but business case, um, and it, make, it that makes up these particular um, requested items uh, here. You can also find on page 25, you'll find a quick summary of our budget request for local funding. So from this document here, if you'll look at the local dollars column and just follow it down, you'll find each business case and the amount of local dollars that's associated with that case and to the far right, the strategic objective in which that particular business case uh, will look to address. Uh, so the, the local column will show you and if we uh, Linda, if you'll scroll on down to the, I think it's the third page, we'll see totals uh, at the bottom and come down to the bottom. I'm, I'm sorry, Linda, I misstated that. Go back to page um, 27, I think it will be. There we go. Thank you, Linda. So you'll see the totals for state, for local, and for federal funds. And you'll see there that our increase in our request from the county, $7.4 million, or roughly a 9.2%. And those detailed totals above show you the specific items that make up that request as, as Dr. Connolly specifically shared. Recently, we had a budget work session with you in which we reviewed our, our planning to this point, shared with you business cases, uh, that were available at that time. I do want to share with you that this budget proposal does include some additional cases and some updates to those cases. We've added one in the academic area, number seven, which will uh, accelerate achievement through targeted school funding of an additional $5 million. We, uh, we have also added the legislative salary and benefit increases uh, which are shown and will be an, a, a potential impact in our budget. We do strongly feel that our employees deserve that pay increase and that it should be a part of the budget and of the funding that will come. To establish, we have looked over the last three years at average increases in our benefits and have tried to take an average as we've estimated what those benefit costs might be. We did modify and amend a couple of, of business cases. Operations number four was amended to from 50,000 to 32,000. And operations number eight, which addresses HVAC systems and the ventilation uh, for our schools, we increased that, that particular request to $11.6 million in efforts to, to meet some of the needs of our facilities um, in, in our schools today. Uh, you can find all the details about these various business cases beginning on page 28 through the end of the document. Each business case is presented as shown here. You'll see the title of that particular business case. Again, the strategic priority that it uh, is addressing. And you will find a description which will give you um, more details about that particular initiative and how monies might be spent um, to accomplish those needs. Mr. Chairman, that is the information I have to share for our, our budget as, um, as represents our superintendent's recommendation for funding for the fiscal year 2022. Thank you, Clyde and uh, Dr. Conlin. Everybody who's worked on this is very thorough and um, I think we're well ahead of schedule to uh, consider it and approve it and get it to uh, the uh, county.
plenty of time for their uh, adequate consideration. Uh, we aim to do this when we have all the committees today, but this is probably the most important thing we do all year, so we'll give it the time it needs. I'd be happy to go around and let any, anybody and everybody uh, speak and ask questions. So, who goes first? Great. I just have a quick Susan. question. Uh, I don't know this, who this would be. The, the new HR 10, which was the uh, instructional staff maintaining the ADM, do we have, in, I mean, are we, are we thinking they're not going to do what they did last year and hold us harmless, or you just including this because you just want to be careful? I, I, I guess that's my question, because that was a new one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Williams. We don't know if the General Assembly is going to hold us harmless. They adjusted their projections, their formula for the way they project um, student enrollment for this upcoming school year. But at this point, that would take a General Assembly action like they did last year. And so because the General Assembly is currently in session and, and it's going to be a long session this year, um, we wanted to build funding into the budget to ensure that in case they did not hold us harmless, that we had identified um, at least an amount of funds and the funding source to be able to keep our school allocations level through the 21 22 school year. So it's, it's more of a um, just in case type of item um, and wanted to be prudent from a fiscal standpoint to have that money available. Don't be, don't be shy. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Mr. McKellar speaking, then I'll get okay, you, Carrie. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Carrie, first to you, ladies first. Okay, thank you, Mr. McKellar. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Conley and the team for putting together such a thorough budget. After 13 years of doing this, the last couple of years, we've had more thorough, uh, precise budgets than ever, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the time in it. Now we need to go ahead and move it forward. It concerns me that education was not even a priority for the commissioners when they listed their priorities. So hopefully when they see this and how thorough it is and how you've broken down every penny, they will see that it's nothing that we're planning to spend excessively, that every penny is going for a purpose. So great job, Dr. Conley. Appreciate everybody that played a part in it together. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Mr. Mr. McKellar? Um, I would agree with Ms. Sutton that if you're just looking at the amount of money and dollars, it is a very thorough budget. Uh, what I would, what, what I will do uh, is uh, to work on next year's budget because I still see the weaknesses that I've always complained about. And that is if somebody here can address these questions that I'm going to propose, then I will take that back. Tell me how much money is being dedicated to low performing schools beyond just what is given to them as a normal school that I can see in this budget. Wouldn't our, with the newest, the ACA07, does that not identify? Maybe I, I may have misread, but I think Dr. Yeah. Wilson Norman can identify because it talks about pay schools, the amount, the percentage that's going to them. Right. It's, I'm on, mine was 34, but I printed it out from home, so I don't know if that's the, it's the ACA07. It was new. Okay, hold on, let me get to that. And it's, um, a, a great state there's statements there that address just the exact things okay. that you're talking about mr mckellar about the uh, the benefits the imp them how they're going to be uh, assessed the impacted metrics let's let dr wilson norman explain yep yes. yes when we look at the newest one that was put in place every school would get an allocation however your lowest performance schools our pay schools would receive a higher per, stu per student allocation, as well as a larger percentage of students being funded in this new business case. So this is one business case in which we have prioritized our pay schools, but we also have others uh, in which the pay schools get additional allocations above and beyond what other schools receive. Yes, okay. As I look at ACA 07, 
I don't see in this business case the answer to my question. Mr. Mattel, it might help. In the humbler, the reason I refer to them as low performance tools. Right, you changed the, the description, which can be confusing for people, okay? Uh, so if you're going if you're going to change the description, you need to have in the document a page that deal with definitions that these are now been changed to this, so that people are looking they're looking for one thing and not finding it where it may exist under a new name. And what I was saying is that we changed that two years ago. We've been saying paste tools, mm -hmm. and so in the business cases, you see reference to paste tools, and in this case. It specifically speaks to our paste tools. Um, and we try to do that in every case that addresses the needs of those high need tools. So we do address it, but. Okay, well, I'm looking at ACA07. I don't even see pay schools listed. It's, it's, the second. it's bolded in that second pay schools allotment. Each of yeah, the children right there. on the screen too. Yeah, it might be easier to see on the screen. Okay, yeah. You're talking about Minus 34. 34. Okay, yeah, that's why I answered that. Community school received $300 per pupil stipend based upon the projected student enrollment. If you go to that step one, the paid schools receive a high percentage. So, so every, every school, school will receive an allocation. Okay, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's take it a step at a time. Okay, I see where you put a statement that pay schools, each of the 22 pay schools will receive a high allocation of students. Now, where do I find where that allocation that they are receiving beyond? We, we have, have an individual, individual worksheet because we do it based on student enrollment. We didn't put it in the budget book, but every school based on their school size. So if a school is 1,000, a middle school, and then you have another school that's 300, is based on the school's population. So we have the percentage figured out on the Excel spreadsheet for each of the schools. Oh, it's right there. Last night. 1.6. And then, and we got 1.9 and then 1.4. That's for all of the remaining schools. Okay, where are the, I, I still don't get, <laughs> I'm trying to put myself in the place of another individual that's trying to look at this, especially a commissioner. And I just, I just don't see it. Uh, either you're not identifying it properly, or you're using. Let me read, let me talk while you process for a second and see if this is makes sense. The elementary allocation is the base allocation for every school. Right. The secondary allocation, 1.9 million, is for all the secondary schools, and then there's an additional 1.6 million for the 23. Pay schools, pay schools as allocated based on population. Correct. Okay. So everybody's got their base in here mm -hmm. and then the overage for the pay school. So if so for uh, an elementary school, each school gets an allocation. Correct. So let's just take 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 one elementary school that is considered a pay school. Okay, you can give me that. Give me what the regular allocation is, and give me the amount above that that becomes part of that 1.615. Every elementary school would receive an allocation for 30% of their students at $300 per student. A pay school would receive an allocation for 45% of their students at $350 per student. So it is a differentiated formula for. A regular elementary school that's not identified as PACE, mm -hmm. and then a higher percentage of students who mm -hmm. would qualify for support, mm -hmm. as well as a higher dollar amount of students who qualify for support. Okay, so tell me this here. 
the statement that you just made is perfectly clear and understandable. But if I look at here at pay schools, I see that 1.6. I don't, I'm not directed to any other page or any other source to review what impact that is having. I mean, I may be, it may be there, but I'm not seeing it, you know? Scroll down. We, we have the, the overarching budget here, but the detail per school is not included in the business case, but we do have that. And Mr. Howard, let me help with that a little bit. In the budget recommendation that comes to the board, it, it would be a 500 page document if we try to put the allotment formulas for each school in here. So we put the summary in this document, but the allotment formulas for each school is the work that the administration does behind the scenes. We just try not to overwhelm the board with providing you all that detail and the formula for each school, but we provide you what the formula is. Does that make sense? Right, but I'm saying Right there, that item, the pay school item there, and the statement that Dr. Norman made. Uh, just below that, if that was just a statement below that, that gives a lot of information. Okay? So I would look at that and see that pace is getting 1.6, and then that statement under identifies basically what she said. I'm good to go. It's clear to me. Okay? But... You having that other information in some drawer or some office someplace? No, it's in here. It's in the paragraph. Okay. In the, in the, in the mold. See what it is? It's at the end of the document. You say each school will receive an allocation of 30% of their student enrollment. Okay, $300 per student stipend based upon projected student enrollment. Okay. Now, And then the next sentence, this one. This one. Okay, I'm. And this here says pay school allotment. So on top of that, each pay school would be allotted at a higher for people funding. Okay, so. So that, that allotment there is what amount? Well, it. It varies by schools, but if, in yes, real it, round numbers, if you took 23 pay schools divided by 1.6 million to $70,000 a school, if it were distributed evenly. But that's so, so I'm saying around $70,000 for the schools that need it to be spent on. So why isn't that state? That's why isn't that you can put a statement like that in there that based upon so this formula. I, I understood it without it being explained. No, but that's you, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Here's the reason why, Mr. Taylor, it is her pupil. And so the only way we can delineate more, we have to show the 23 schools and how many pupils they have. But that service is showing for the 23 schools, they get a higher amount based on the number of students they have in their school, which is different for all 23. Does that help? Well, I, have the same I understand what you're saying, but I'm Some trying to say they that. Need, make it less than 70. Right. Right. It's about, if you're doing it per pupil of the impact of schools, it's about as fair as you can get. So I don't think you're, you're questioning the distribution method. What are you questioning? I'm because I'm not clear of the question. Well, I'm, I'm saying that the statements, they do they identify things overall in some cases. But I'm saying, and I'm trying to put myself into position of other people, like the county commissioners, for example. When they read this document, I can almost guarantee you they're not going to get the information that we have available, okay? And when they look at this, that's going to be the weakness because I'm like, just about every one of those kind of commissioners is going to be concerned with when I read, I want to identify what is happening with the local forming schools. They, they know 
the general operation of the school system. That's not in question, okay? We all know you get money from the federal government, state government, and local government. That's not the question. The question is, when I look at this document, which is supposed to be represent our strategic plan, do I walk away and say, I now understand for the local form of schools, which should be our target, that should be our template that we get measured by. Because if you can improve those, it's like when, when the water rises, all boats come up. You can improve the local form of schools, you're going to improve all the other schools, okay? And we should be bold enough to show that and have that in the document, and that should be given some timetables. What's going to be accomplished? I know in the, in the strategic plan we have what's going to be accomplished over the next four or five years. But I'm saying, if a person's got to go from one document to another document to that it, it don't, Ms. McKenna. It, it, it's all right here. I think the difference is in Cumberland, we do not refer to them as low performance schools. I understand right? that. But everything you're asking is right there. I, 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 maybe I, I need some help with understanding. So, asked as, me, if somebody asked me, what are you doing for okay, the pay I, I would say, uh, Let me say this. Say that T.C. Barron, for example, if it was operating, would be a pay school, right? Yes. Okay. My question to you, if I look in this document, now I know T.C. Barron is not operating now, but if I look in this it is. document, it's, 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 I, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's fully operational. That okay? We'll use TC Barron. What is what? What, what do I find in here? TC Barron, number of pupils, and the allocation that they will be going for that. All right, Mr. John, I was to that this way. It it's a pleasure of the board, but historically, at the board level. We do not delineate the 89 schools in the budget document. Okay. That's in the budget, but normally we don't get that granular at the board level, but I, I'll do whatever the board wants me to do. No. Well, no. the board don't want you to do that, but what there should be is some written in this document, some idea of what, how the money is being spent and what the target goals are and what is to be accomplished with the spending of these funds. As I was going to say a minute ago, the, uh, Mr. McKellar, if somebody asked me, what are you, what is Cumberland County Schools, what's the board doing for pay schools, I would say we've got 23 pay schools and they are receiving a higher per pupil um, funding than the other schools. Right. So they get more money for, mm -hmm. you know. And that money, the, the additional money, where is the goals that that is to accomplish? All right. right. So, so that, that is in. And then, then you go to the strategic plan. No, no, right. and you're, it's in here. In the individual cases, in here, mm -hmm. each one that addresses pay schools, it says that on the page. And all of those hold up to 1.6. Okay. So as you go through the cases, you'll see that some of them specifically speak to pay school. Is that right, yes, Norman? Yes. ACA 02 yeah. speaks to high intensity tutoring for pay schools. So outlined throughout many of our cases, uh, ACA 07 is one piece for our pay schools, but we have other avenues as well that we're looking at in supporting our pay schools. If it would help, when, we, when we, the board does its version, not with the normal side, if it would help, we can put in a summary page of all the cases by name and number that address pay schools. Would that help? No. Well, let me, let, me, let me speak as chair of the committee for a minute. Um, 
we're held to a higher standard as board members to read this ahead of time and to do our dead level best to understand it in its entirety. And I almost want to read and take seven minutes and read this very well crafted paragraph, executive summary to well, everybody. You don't need but to do that, that, that as far as I'm hey, concerned. That's fine, but I still may do it. Okay. That's so, um, but it's all in here. Okay. And I doubt the commissioners, and I'm not talking to you, I doubt the commissioners are going to read it in its entirety. Our part is to understand it and then to support it fully that we have the confidence for them to implement it, to implement it. And that's what we've got to get behind instead of nitpicking. The, the metrics are here on it and the allocation is explained. And um, who else has questions about the budget? I mean, I, I mean, you certainly keep, I want you to fully understand it and fully support it because that is more important than one individual metric or one of the business cases. We have got to get behind this budget 100% or they're going to give us $500,000 more like they did the last seven, five years. So, but continue to, to you. I'm I'm All right. I have a Harry, comment. Musgrave. Um, well, number one, I, I think it was condescending about the seven minutes. It took me longer than that to uh, deal with it. And some things I still don't understand. So we didn't need to hear that. But what I do want to know is what do they call the Cumberland County pay schools in DPI? Do they call them low performing? They call them their designated low performing schools um, at the Department of Public Instruction is what they call them. We decided to call them PACE because schools are making progress and they may be designated as low performing, but it was a negative impact to the schools, the teachers and the communities. And so that's when we begin to look at calling them PACE as a way to not change the work that needs to be done, but to motivate, empower, and support the work that is going on. So that is why we decided to call them pay schools in Cumberland. But they are called low performing at the Department of Public Instruction. And right now we have 23 pay schools. Yes. Or do we know? Yes, we have 23. Um, that hasn't changed because we haven't been reassessed again. And so that we'll have 23 through the 21-22 school year because the designations of those schools will not change. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Musgrave. Karen, Ms. Sutton. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. I think it's thorough. I've said it before. I've done this 13 years now. In the last couple of years, we've had the most thorough budget. And I do think it's something that we've got to all support because if we're not all supporting it, that gives a message that we don't all agree. So we need to reach the point where all of us agree and we can move forward and then present it and stand behind it. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Jones. I think that's one reason why we have to make sure that no matter how small the question seems, you have to respond to that uh, question if someone asks that because all board members have the right to answer, to ask as many questions as they want to about anything that deals with the Cumberland County school system. Thank you, because Ms. Musgrave. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And Ms. Jones has a question. Uh, yes, I do have a question. It's pertaining to um, new program, EC Parent Facilitation Specialist. And my question is um, the duties which That's that person, page 22, page 22, uh, SSS-13, will that person be interacting with the parents or they're interacting with the schools to help with the parents? Exactly what is that position? Page 22. Page 22. Jones, I believe. I'll start by, we'll be able to answer that question. Ms. Jones, I was trying to find a case. Would you mind uh, 
this page 22? Well, it's, it's page SSS 13. SSS 13. Yeah, SSS 13. The full business case is page 72, the EC parent facilitation specialist. Is that right, Ms. Jones? Is it? So we're on page 72 of the big the business cases. There's a specific person that's supposed to do the out-of-state IEPs and the... This person will monitor the out-of-state IEPs and make sure that the parents' rights are being protected from that standpoint. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Others? We want to ask, we want to be able to entertain every question you might have. So as with entertain it, my hope is to be able to get full board support as we move forward. So we're here. We want to answer whatever question you might have so we can try to, in all that genuine, get understanding. Dr. We're here. Dr. I'm sorry. I'm a Floridiancy, I'm, and I know, but I try not to be that. Just, just for making sure everybody did recognize that that the SYS01 and SYS02 are new. They were not in that original document, um, and I think you know, I think we've already talked about that. But just making sure everybody sees it because we're talking about salary. You know, looking after salary increases and benefit increases, and, and both of those were new. I spent hours on this yesterday morning. As a matter of fact, it was more like six or seven uh, going through the information and um, texting Dr. Conley and even Greg saying, is this new, is this new? So, um, but I just wanna make sure everybody realizes that that's there. There were four additions that I caught and, um, and added to my description. So just make sure everybody sees those. And I think Clyde put those in the memo to us yesterday at the bottom down here it's just so those are the four new ones that Susan's talking about um well, certainly um, i have one other question yes ma'am miss musgrave the floor is yours yeah i it just um you know with all that we have on the agenda today i wonder why this was a considered item today with all of the other things that we had to discuss. I didn't get my packet until yesterday evening. And I can't, uh, you know, digest all of this. I had a, a hard time when we had the business cases, you know, so you, you get yours a little sooner than I do, I guess. But uh, no, I, just wanted to I got know. mine last night. Well, all, they don't, there were only four were additional. Online, so we've had. Yeah. They're the same as we had weeks ago. With just the exception with, um, of those four. Four small ones. But I, I hear your point. Thank you. Um, well, I just, I mean, seriously, let's um, ask any more questions we've got, but I'm going to speak for a second. If you'll go to page 11 of the budget document, it's about our local funding from the county commissioners, and this speaks to what Ms. Sutton was saying that I think it's incumbent on us to be unified in our request. Um, in past years, recent past years, we tend to bicker with each other or bicker with Dr. Connolly um, about points here or there and not be unanimous. And it's, it's received at the county commissioner level. But if you look at that last paragraph um, there, they've, four years ago, they funded us at 80 million. And see, the reason we're, discussing the local appropriation that's all we can control mm -hmm. the state gives us what they're going to give us i mean we can bet you know lobby but we don't can't directly affect that and the federal we certainly can affect even less so this is really the only additional money we can affect ourselves and <coughs> you can see they gave us 80 million and 082 and then four years later we've gone up a whopping eight one thousandths of a percent um to 80 million 711 last year so and i've made this point but I, you know, it's not resonating with too many people that inflation over the same four-year period has gone up 7.3 percent so in essence we're going backward we've got less spending power each and every year um so and with in my understanding and clyde and dr Collins, if i'm right you know if the legislative 
changes in salary increases are seven million, and they don't give us what we're asking in an increase, we've got to cut that out of these pay schools and all the other things we want to do locally. Um, <coughs> We have to pay our employees. If we don't, you know, have a unified ask and try to get seven million or eight million more dollars, seven point four, then we're going to have to um, cut even deeper. And I imagine if we go to the allocation that we could send to our uh, at-risk schools and at-risk students. So um, I don't know why they can't even see. It's all right. They're underfunding our children because we're getting less money, less real money from them each and every year. So I don't know how we can um, ask, and I'd rather us talk about how we can go about asking them and impacting them more effectively. And I'd like for us to spend some time talking about that. But question. Anyway, yes. Hang on one second, Miss Chisholm. Yes, ma'am. Oh. All of the money that we get is state and federal. They tell us what we can do with what we can't do with anything else. We can't get some of the money. Some of the money saved. Some of the money we have, like you said, that we can manage the money that the right. Ms. Chisholm. Right. As Mr. Chisholm. Right. 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 Things in Cumberland County that we're that we're trying to accomplish. So it's very important money, and if we've got to use it all up on salary matches, then it all goes to benefits and not to the children directly. So anyway, um, others. I think somebody online had a question. Musgrave or Sutton. Yeah, I had a question. I I wanted to know. Um, uh, you, we want to get the budget to the county commissioners, but when is it due there? I'll let Clyde help with the timeline. Uh, legislation, it is due May 15. We have, over the past couple of years or so, tried to get that to them in the April time period to give them more time for planning and considering our, our request and funding of our request. So our goal had been to try to get that to them um, in, in April, by the middle of April. The board meeting is April 15th. 15th. 12th, 13th? 12th is a Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So our, our only board meeting in April to approve it is April 13th. So uh, that's why it's before us today in keeping with our typical annual procedure. Dr. Connor? Well, I, I'd like to make a motion that this be brought back to us for our board meeting on April 15th, uh, because I would like to get some further information. And if I get that information, I can support it. But if we go today, I will not be able to support it. And I would like to support it, because I think the numbers numbers are right, but I just don't think that they're, they're showing the impact and everything that we should have for our pay school. Mr. Lester, I, I will second that motion. Um, go ahead, Dr. Conley. Well, we're, we're asking today for the finance committee to approve this going forward to the full board. So what we're asking for today, Mr. Patella, is exactly what you said. The full board is not voting today. It is the finance committee voting to send this forward to the full board for the full board to consider it on at the full board meeting, at which time the full board will vote on it. So you have opportunity to do exactly what you're asking. Um, so I, I just want to make that clear. That, that is what we're asking today of the finance committee. And it would still allow you to two weeks, or really, till April 13th, whatever, April 13th, to get your questions answered in hopes to have full support then. Um, now, uh, 
if for some reason Dr. Connor, you or Mr. Locklear see that, but maybe we do need to add this to this document between now and the next board meeting. The actions that we are taking today, would that be permissible? <clears throat> because we are proving a document today from the committee standpoint but we got to intervene in time between now and the board and if for example something need to be changed in this document is that permissible there will be edits between the superintendent's budget recommendation what you will have at the board meeting is the board's recommendation. So if there's something that needs to be added, it will be added before the final budget is set forward to the commissioners. Or when those boards and commissioners, it won't be the superintendent's recommendation. It will be whatever changes occur between this document and the board's final document. Well, so, see, yes, sir. Right. The way I see that going is this approving it today moves it forward, keeps it on the schedule that we need to be on to meet the county commissioners. But obviously, we can modify it that evening uh, as we see fit, and and uh, you know, you know, yeah. hopefully, unanimously but, adopt it then. Yes, sir. Yeah, what what uh, my hope would be is that if there, I'm not saying there will be any changes in anything, but if there are changes. I would like to see those changes made and when the budget comes for our board meeting, <clears throat> then we know what the document is, we can go ahead and approve it. Not be at our board meeting, making amendments and changes there for that document. That's that, what I'm trying that's to what do. we hope would happen between today right. and when we bring the final document forward. Any other adjustments that need to be made we were made okay. those beforehand. And if we would all, you know, we just all commit each other to, to read the material, you know, as soon as we get it. And granted, some of this comes late. It's just the nature of the timing of stuff. And these okay. meetings are moved up to try to work around spring break, um, if I recall. So, um, but I think all that will be transparent and be done ahead of time on email. And there's only going to be, like you said, at most one, two, or three substantive changes. Right. So I think we can process those in the interim. Okay. But we can. We can do that then. All right, well, thank you. Today. Thank you for that. Any other um, questions before we entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's budget? Well, we got a motion on the floor. Well, no, Ms. Musgrove's not on the committee. And, uh, um, she's not on the committee. So, uh, oh, 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 okay. So, okay. All right. I'll entertain it. I don't know which one. So, it is. Mr. McKellar's motion dies for lack of a second. Yeah, all right. I, I will. I've not got all my stuff in front of me. What What is our number on this, Pete? Wait, just. Um, I make a motion that we we approve 4.07. Which is consider approval of September's budget proposal for fiscal year 22. We have a motion from Ms. Williams. I'll second it. Okay. Right, Ms. I Sutton. Okay. I'll give it to you, Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton. No. For the, we'll recognize the time lag uh, for the internet. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, let's vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank, Thank you, y'all. Mr. West. Thank you, guys. That was unanimous. And please, uh, in the coming days, get any of your clarification questions to the superintendent. Um, immediately so that we can get their answers in plenty of time to consider it and and please consider my request that how we ask for it is as important as what we're asking for because we asked for nine million last year and got five hundred thousand or one hundred thousand or whatever it was a very small amount so yeah thank you so um we've um we've got to do better and hope they do better so with that, um, that was the last item. Thank you for a long budget meeting, uh, atypically long, but important. Um, and any other committee concerns? Mm -hmm. We didn't do this earlier, but I'd like to welcome Joe back. He's over there and came up and uh, welcome back. Uh, 
been a long, long time since we've seen you, and I'm uh, glad you're back. Uh, hearing no further information, I'll adjourn the Budget and Finance Committee and turn it over to Ms. Jones for Policy Committee. Thank you. I'd like to call to order the Policy Committee. The members are myself, Ms. Sutton, Ms. Van, and Mr. Warhol. 5.02. I'd like to consider the adoption of the agenda. I'd like to get a motion. I'll move, I'll move. to um, approve the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a second? Second. second? All right. We have a motion from Ms. Van and a second from Ms. Sutton. And please vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we're moving on to 5.03. Consider approval of the February 2nd, 2021 policy committee minutes. And can I get a motion? I move that we approve 5.03. Second. I'll second it. And we got a motion from Ms. Sutton and second from Mr. Warhol. And please vote. Ms. Sutton. Yes. That's unanimous, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Now we're moving on to 5.04. Consider approval of seven policy revisions. Mr. Soika, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, if we could have uh, the first policy pulled up, and if you could jump to page six of seven on that policy, Ms. Susan. Okay, um, this, uh, let me just start off. And, and preface this by saying we have what seems like a lot of policy revisions in front of you, but they're all basically technical revisions, including this one we have up on the board right now. They're all required um, under applicable law, and they're all recommended by the School Boards Association. So what, what we're looking at here is a portion of your existing Title I policy that just outlines all the basic expectations for um, the operation of the Title I program and receipt of Title I funds. And what we're adding there, and the additions are noted in blue, at subparagraph B is the requirement that's been on the books for some time that we notify parents if they are assigned to a classroom that does not have a highly qualified teacher or a fully credentialed teacher in place. Um, and that's just a notice requirement of Title I. We've been doing that. Um, if the, the policy had just not caught up with that requirement. Likewise, um, right below that, there's just a very general requirement that we keep uh, parents informed of their children's progress on the state's academic assessments. And of course, we're doing that. So um, these are just technical additions to the policy to bring the policy in conformity with what we're doing and what Title I requires. So that, that would be the first one. Um, hearing no questions on that one, you can jump to the next policy, Ms. Caesar. And this is, uh, a, a, again, a, a technical change to an existing student and parent grievance procedure. I, I will just share with you all, in the interest of time and, and not intending to gloss over anything, this policy and the three that follow it, all have technical changes that are brought about by those Title IX policies that you all had to adapt back in the fall. If you'll recall, when you adopted those Title IX policies, it made that for the first time ever, we had specific policies that dealt with sexual harassment, and then we would have more generic policies that would deal with all other kinds of grievances or other types of discrimination and all these changes are doing on this policy and the next four is just a line in the policy numbers and the titles uh, with some minor wording changes so that all of our grievance policies refer back and forth to each other correctly now that we've added the specific Title IX sexual harassment grievance policies. So unless board members have specific questions or concerns, I will just leave it there on those four policies and ask Ms. Caesar to jump to 
policy 3101, dual enrollment. I'm sorry, Linda, about you. you're right there. The, the only change here is just to delete the old tech prep um, verbiage that we used to have here in North Carolina um, and, and to just update this policy. Again, it's not going to change anything about how we operate our dual enrollment classes. And then the last policy, 3102, um, this does add some language that's quite significant in light of how we've been operating over the last year. If you scroll, scroll down, let's see, so there you go. There's a new paragraph on remote learning because previously the online instruction policy just contemplated situations where individual children or individual classes might be delivered online. It didn't contemplate what we've been doing for the past year. But of course, what we've been doing is authorized under North Carolina state law and, you know, all the various um, emergency or, or executive orders from the governor, et cetera. Um, but this paragraph that comes to us at the recommendation of the School Boards Association is intended to cover the kind of widespread district-wide remote learning that we've been engaged in for the last year. And it also makes the important point that when we're operating the system basically all virtually, and we hope that you know we're we're at the end of that, and you know won't ever have to do it again. But if it ever occurred again, um, it makes clear that in that situation there are certain board policies that that just don't apply, and it, it gives the board and the administration an out if um, there is a requirement somewhere else in the policy manual that would say, you know, this is the way you, you deliver instruction. I'm just using that as an example. But if it's just impossible or not practical in a virtual remote learning setting, then this kind of builds in uh, a waiver of, of any conflicting requirements. So again, um, I think it's important just to have this on the books. Uh, we hope that the pandemic is, is getting to an end and, and that We'll be able to have kids back in classes um, full time here shortly and certainly next fall. But if we ever need this paragraph, um, I think it's a good idea to have it there. So, um, again, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, Ms. Jones, or committee members, board members. But that brings me to the end of the policy revisions that were on your agenda today. Thank you. Does anyone, committee members or board members, have any questions? <clears throat> All right, since there's no questions, uh, we'd like to uh, go for a vote on the, uh, I'm sorry, make a motion, approval of the seven policy revisions. I will move to approve the seven policy revisions as stated in 5.04. Thank you. Can I get a second? I'll second it. So we have a motion by Ms. Fan and Mr. Walker second. And can we please vote? Ms. Sutton? Yes. Hey, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Keith. And do we have any other committee concerns? Since there are none, I'd like to adjourn the policy committee and turn it over to Ms. Van. All right. Thank you. And I'd like to call the curriculum committee um, to order. And the members are myself. Uh, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Sutton, and Mrs. Williams. Uh, at this time, uh, I will uh, entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. I move that we adopt the agenda. I second it. All right. It was properly motioned and seconded. If we would please vote. Mrs. Sutton? Yes. Come on now. Okay, that's unanimous, Ms. Van. All right. Moving on to 6.03, consider approval of the February 25th Curriculum Committee Minutes. I will entertain. Second. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sutton and Ms. Williams. Everybody vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous, Ms. Payne. Thank you. And moving on to 604, 
um, and the rest of our um, many things that we have. Dr. Uh, Wilson Norman is here and we're going to look at approval of memorandum of agreement between Cumberland County Board of Education, FTCC, and Cumberland Polytechnic High School. Yes, we have our annual memorandum of agreement and Tanika Williams will walk us through our agreement that supports Polytechnic and Fayetteville Technical Community College. Ms. Williams. Dr. Wilson Norman, good morning, members of the board. Before you, you have the annual memorandum of understanding between the Cumberland County Schools Board of Education and Fayetteville Technical Community College. We have not updated this agreement since 2017 to reflect the changes in our leadership, both in the Cumberland County Schools and at Fayetteville Technical Community College. We ask that you um, will review and approve this item. Anybody have any comments or questions? No, uh, I move that we approve uh, what is uh, six point oh four. Second. Thank you. Uh, properly motioned and seconded. If you vote. Miss Sutton. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. All right, moving on to our renewal form for Innovative High School. Yes. Uh, this is our operations with um, our Cooperative Innovative High School, uh, or what we call Cumberland Polytechnic High School, which operates on the campus of Devil Technical Community College. Every five years, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction asks that the two institutions review the agreement of the original application and the funding <coughs> and to, um, to determine if they would like to continue to operate. So the request that is before you today is permission to continue to operate our Cooperative Innovative High School, Cumberland Polytechnic High School, on the campus of Fayetteville Technical Community College. We ask that you review and accept this item. Any comments or um, questions? Wait, were there any changes to the um, <coughs> renewal no, from last year? No, ma'am. There are no fundamental changes. Um, when we originally submitted the application for funding, there were only about six or seven pathways uh, that we had included in that application. So now that we have assessed um, and we're five years out and we've seen the growth of Cumberland Polytechnic and the interest of our students, we are just going to try to open up more pathways uh, for our students. And basically, they're, they're open to anything that's on the campus of FTCC unless it is restricted by age or other governing requirements. Um, so we do ask that you accept this and, and being mindful that this is an action item that is highly time sensitive. We have to return this to NCDPI by March the 31st. So once it's approved by committee, it will need to be approved, uh, signed off on by the board and Dr. Connolly for submission to the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Oh, we don't have much time. Okay, Ms. Williams. Uh, with that said, I recommend that we approve 6.03. I make a motion. I move. Second. All right. Thank you. We'll vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. All right. Um, moving on to what, 6.06? .06? Yes, ma'am. That is the memorandum of understanding between the Cumberland County Schools Board of Education and the Federal Technical Community College. Uh, for approval to continue our operations under career and college promise. The revisions to this also reflect uh, the change in our Cumberland County Schools and FTCC leadership since 2017 when it was updated, as well as other legislative changes that uh, occurred during last school year to include uh, opening up CCP opportunities to specific qualified eligible students in grades 9 and 10 who are not enrolled in a cooperative innovative high school. We ask that you review and approve this item. Any questions or comments? All right, I'll entertain a motion. Well, I'll go ahead and move to approve 6.06, uh, .06, the memorandum of agreement between FTCC and Cumberland County Board of Education. Second it. Thank you. If we'll vote. Ms. Sutton? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. All Thank you. right. Thank you. 
And at this time, I think uh, we moved to 6.07, approval of the school calendars for yes. 21 and 22. Uh, Ms. Musselwhite will present calendars for the next two school years, and this is a consider item. Ms. Musselwhite? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good. I'm Ms. Pham, Dr. Wilson Norman, for allowing me to present the draft 2021, 2022, and 2022, 2023 calendars for our four tracks of instruction. Um, I'm sharing these calendars with you on behalf of the calendar committee and cabinet. I know you cannot read that. It's most like to do is speak up a little bit. I know you cannot read that document in front of you, but that is um, the LEA summary of the legislative requirements for the calendars. We'll look, Kevin, if you'll advance to the next slide, we'll look at some of those um, requirements as we look at the traditional school calendar. This traditional school calendar for 21-22 is um, the most restricted because we are um, guided by current legislation to just have the start date for students no earlier than Monday, closest to August 26. And you will see that date noted on your calendar in green. There are other requirements that are listed to the side. I'll point those out as we move on to the next slide. Actually, Kevin, go back one. And looking at the start of the calendar, August 19th through 16th and August the 20th are work days that allow teachers to set up their classrooms, have school level meetings, training, engage in individual and collaborative planning. The school's school improvement teams can also make some of these work days required for teachers for school level PD, for collaborative planning, for open house, and other purposes as the school improvement team determines. Each of our calendars, traditional and all the other calendars, also have system wide required work days for professional development and training already <coughs> scheduled on the calendar. The legislation also requires that teachers are provided a minimum of 10 work days, and it requires that two of those work days are not obligated with training or required activities. Looking back up in August, you see that August 23rd is the first day for students. This is in compliance with legislation that requires that the first day for students must be no earlier than the Monday closest to August 26th. Legislation requires the same holidays in our calendars as the State Personnel Commission for State Employees, and these are indicated on all of our calendars in red. You'll see the first holiday is in September for Labor Day. Legislation also requires a minimum of 10 required annual leave days. These required annual leave days are embedded in December, allowing a winter break in between the holidays that are required, and in April, allowing a spring break for employees and students. The legislation requires that makeup days are identified in case of inclement weather, so the optional work days of November 24th, January 4th, and February 14th are noted and they will serve as these makeup days if needed. Our 10 month employees, which accounts for the majority of the school level staff, are required to have exactly 215 days on the payroll. These days include all of the work days, whether they're required or optional, 
all of the holidays, all of the required annual leave days, and all instructional days. Kevin, if you go to the next slide. The legislation also requires that calendars are built to provide students either 185 instructional days or 1,025 instructional hours in the school year. And each of the Cumberland County School calendars are built to comply with the 1,025 <coughs> instructional hours requirement. Um, after following each of our calendars, you will see these instructional hours broken down. Kevin, if you'll go to the next slide. This is the draft of the year-round calendar for 21-22. The year-round calendar is required to comply with the same legislative requirements, with the exception of the start date and end date. Instead, the year-round calendar is built to allow students an intercession at the beginning of each grading period, I'm sorry, at the end of each grading period. And the year-round legislation defines that students will attend school for a grading period of approximately 45 days, followed by 15 days of intercession. So the intercession dates are non-instructional days for students and days off payroll for the staff unless one of those days is designated as a work day. The school level employees, as I said, are off the payroll with the exception of any required annual leave days, work days, or holidays that fall during the student's intercession block. Kevin, let's go to the next slide. Year round must also comply with 1,025 instructional hours. Next slide, please. The early colleges and innovative high schools, including Cross Creek Early College, Cumberland International, Cumberland Polytech, have to comply with the same legislative requirements, unlike the year round calendar. The start date of the Monday closest August 26 is not a requirement for these schools. The high school's calendars closely follow the academic calendar of the colleges that they're associated with. The 22-23 draft calendars for traditional year-round and innovative high schools are built the same as 21-22 calendars. If you compare them side by side, they almost mirror each other. The calendar committee members provided input on the calendars that were relevant to them. And the members also shared the calendar with staff, school improvement teams, parents, and other colleagues. So I ask, um, I ask that these calendars be considered for approval. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Well, I was that's the next school year. Yeah. Oh, I was, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Any they, questions they on actually mirror the 21 22? You know, we there are a lot of unanswered questions about um, 22 23 school year. So um, we have developed those calendars to look just like basically the 21 22. And um, as you know, in years past, if there are any necessary changes, we'll bring those back to the board, make um, minor adjustments. It's it's also possible that we could get some legislative changes for next school year calendars. Right. Um, DPI has cautioned us that that might take place, but it has not yet. So these calendars, um, you know, we're seeking approval of these calendars to move forward. Okay. Well, I um I had a question, but it's been answered but um, i thought we could write a waiver or something to start before that that monday of the 26th 
we we have we do not no. have that. It's the hours. I mean the minutes and the. Yeah, we okay. we follow the thousand twenty five. Um, even last year, when the legislative um, required schools to start five days early, um, we still followed the thousand twenty five. Well, I was sitting here looking. That's why I was sort of tuned out because we had gotten an email yesterday asking about election day having you know that being a, and, and it is. <laughs> well, it's a work. Day. It's a work day, yeah, but it always has been. But it but that email had talked about the children being off, and day. they are off, and yeah, they usually are. For so that's what I was checking out <laughs> again after we got the email. But it is I and. I don't have any questions on it. Does anybody? I appreciated right. you explaining the 215. I mean, I've always known that, but I will have people ask me, I mean, even teachers will say, why are there so many work days here? And why? when I first started teaching, I was a nine month employee. And so that additional 10th month allowed us to have training and the professional development that we tried to cram into two or three days before school started. Um, but you have to work the days to get paid. And if you don't work them, you don't get the extra month. And um, again, it made a lot of difference in my life that third year teaching when we went to 10 months. Yes. Um, and, and I was grateful for the opportunity. So I, I appreciate you presenting that. I don't think there's probably any teachers on this today because they're in the classroom, but uh, I do appreciate it. Well, we try to um, explain that to the calendar committee so they can go back out. The calendar committee um, did go back out, share it with their staff and their schools, their SIT teams, with parents. So if, um, the calendars have been shared quite a bit. Calendar proposals. Okay. I will um, entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve 6.07, approval of school calendars. Second. All right. It was properly motioned by Ms. Williams, and I think um, Ms. Jones got the second this time. And so if everybody will please vote. Ms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Williams? Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Lillibar. Um, Any other uh, curriculum committee? Concerns? No other items at this time. Okay, thank you. What about with the um, board or the committee? Right. Well, if that's the case, then I am going to uh, adjourn the curriculum committee and pass it on to Mrs. Sutton. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ann. My host committee are myself, Judy Musgrave, Nathan Warfel, and Susan Williams. Uh, First item is 7.02, consider adoption of the agenda. I entertain a motion. I make a motion that we adopt the agenda. Okay, we have a motion from Ms. Williams. Second that. And second from Ms. Uh, Musgrave, Mr. Waffle, I'm gonna give it to the lady. Uh, if there's no discussion, P, I approve, and you can call the roll. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay. Uh, 7.03, consider approval of February 25th, 2021 personnel committee minutes. I entertain a motion. I make that motion that we approve 7.03. Second. We have a motion from Ms. Sutton and a second from Ms. Williams. If there's no discussion, Pete, I approve. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. All right, and 7.04, consumer approval. Did I hear someone? No, okay. not carried. Is everything okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. And I didn't introduce Ruben to you. Ruben is with us. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is 7.04, consider approval of personnel. And I'm sure all the committees have looked at it and if there's no discussion, I entertain a motion. I'll make a motion for approval of personnel. Okay, we have a motion 
from Mr. Walker and a second from Ms. Williams. And I approve. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay, that's your okay. Ms. Ms. Okay. Sutton, if I may, just uh, one quick item on that, on, on that particular item. Okay. I just, I, I did just want to point out um, several months ago, we shared with the board um, a special grant program that we were uh, able to access through um, Governor Cooper's office with regards to the NC Ed Corps. Um, and so we had some additional um, names on the list today. And so I just wanted to share that with you. These individuals are working uh, through this program with the governor's office and they're assisting in the district working on uh, activities such as contact tracing with our health services department, working with our um, our counselors and our social workers in the schools um, and with parent engagement and technology activities. I just I did want to point that out to the board. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Any other comments or discussion? Okay, we'll move on to 7.05. Uh, consider approval of leaves of absence and special leaves of absence. Ms. Sutton, before before there's a motion on the floor, I did I did also want to point out on this item, you see several names that are part of the North Carolina State uh, Northeast Leadership Academy. This is a, a partnership with North Carolina State. Our first set of uh, uh, MSA uh, candidates through our partnership with North Carolina State University. So I did want to point that out as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Okay. I entertain a motion. I make a motion we approve 7.05. We have a motion from Ms. Williams. Second. And I second it. Okay. Well, Ms. Musgrave, I give it to you. Second from Ms. Musgrave. If there's no discussion, uh, Pete will take the roll and I approve. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. Okay. That's unanimous. Okay. And my 7.06 is a consider item to go into closed session. And I entertain a motion. Okay, I'll make that motion. To preserve confidentiality uh, of matters protected from disclosure pursuant to North Carolina Journal Statute 115C-319 and North Carolina Journal Statute 143-31811A1 and to preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.1183. Second. Motion from Ms. Sutton and second from Ms. Williams. There is no discussion. We take vote. I approve the. Ms. Musgrave? Yes. I think that's unanimous. We're in close session. Okay. We're in close session.
Pete, can you hear me? Miss Sutton, I don't think they're they've turned their camera and mic on. We can hear you. So once they come back on, you'll be heard. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, ma'am. Kevin. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you too. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Kevin, can you, can you hear me? We can hear Miss Sutton and Miss Musgrave. Yes, you guys are are good to go. Okay. So can we go ahead? I'll, I'll make a motion to come out of closed session. Second. Okay. We uh, we have a motion to come out of closed session from Mr. Waffle, and I will second it. Is okay. So, uh, Ms. Sutton, you say yes. Ms. Musgrave. Yes. Okay. So that was unanimous. Okay, that was unanimous, Miss uh, Sutton. We're out of close session. No, ma'am. Okay, uh, good time meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Before, um, we have learned, uh,